constructing it. So, Mr. Chairman, I believe we can go ahead and start whenever you want. If I could just make two brief uh, logistical announcements before we begin. Commissioners, the, your microphone is on when the red light is on. It's the reverse of in the Capitol. If the red light is on, your mic is on. If it's not, uh, the mic is off. However, we discovered during the run through yesterday, these are very sensitive microphones. And if somebody two, two seats away has their mic on and is speaking, it will pick up cross chatter. So I would recommend that people um, just be aware of that. They are they are very sensitive. And the other thing I'll add very briefly is that we uh, yesterday afternoon, we added one additional witness. Each of you has a revised uh, agenda, which includes that witness, Summer Stephan, the district attorney of San Diego County, and also has her witness bio. That's at each of your uh, desks. So she will be the last witness of the day talking about labor trafficking. With that, Mr. Chairman, we can begin. Um, thank you. And I should point out to uh, my fellow commissioners, the. Uh, there is a, a black button right underneath the red button on the uh, desktop. So if you want to mute yourself, you can you can do that. But do be aware that these microphones are uh, some of the finest technology you're going to find anywhere, and it'll pick up uh, your remarks about your family history or whatever else you share with your neighbor. Let's um, uh, call to order. This is the Little Hoover Commission. We are going to have a report on report implementation status hearing Thursday, September 28th of 2023. Uh, my name is Pedro Nava. I'm the chair of the Little Hoover Commission. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I want to introduce the other commissioners who are here. Joining us today is Vice Chair Anthony Canella, Commissioners Dion Ariner, uh, David Beyer, Gil Garcetti, Jason Johnson, and Jana Sidley. Uh, Commissioner Jose Atilio Hernandez is joining us uh, remotely. Uh, and uh, we're uh, grateful to have him participating. Also with us today are the commission staff, Executive Director Ethan Rarick, Deputy Executive Director Tamar Foster, Analyst Ashley Hurley, Ali Powell, and Sharon McAllister, as well as Project Manager Crystal Beckham. Uh, let's do a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, we're gonna break for lunch around noon. We'll reconvene the hearing uh, probably around 1 p.m. The commission will hold a business meeting during lunch the business meeting is open to the public and you're welcome to attend if you wish. We are live streaming today's hearing on Zoom. We will be joined by members of the public who attend remotely. We'll have a public comment session at the end of the hearing. If you're here with us in person and you wanna make a public comment, please fill out a public comment slip and give it to one of our staff members. Members of the public who have joined us online will be muted during the hearing. Those who wish to make a comment will be unmuted during the public comment session later in the hearing. If you wanna make a public comment online, please use the raise hand feature in Zoom by clicking on the hand icon to join our public comment queue. Those who have joined us by phone may either dial pound nine, I'm sorry, star nine, to raise their hand on Zoom or send an email to littlehoover at lhc.ca.gov, letting us know you wanna address the commission. Please provide your phone number from which you have joined so our staff knows who to unmute. Staff will be monitoring raised hands and emails requesting comment throughout our hearing. As is usual at commission hearings, public comment is limited to three minutes per speaker. The audio and video of our remote hearing witnesses will be turned on when it is their turn to speak. We are recording today's hearing and after the hearing, staff will place a permanent link to the recording on our website and upload it to our YouTube channel. Now to the substance of today's hearing. The commission is charged with making recommendations to the legislature and governor to improve state government. We have a longstanding policy of supporting legislation and other steps that implement those recommendations. And going forward, we hope to increase our focus on whether the commission's recommendations are being implemented. This hearing is part of that effort. The first hearing in quite some time to review the implementation of past commission reports. Today's hearing will focus on our reports on two critical issues to which state government must respond, intimate partner violence and the trafficking of human beings for labor exploitation. In 2019, the commission launched an assessment of the state's response to intimate partner violence, culminating in the production of two reports, one released in 2020 and one in 2021. Those reports included recommendations to strengthen California's policy. The commission also issued three reports in the fall and summer of 2020 on California's response to labor trafficking. These reports offer recommendations to help the state better coordinate its work 
uncover these crimes, support survivors, and bring traffickers to justice. Today's hearing will feature witnesses to assess the degree to which the Commission's recommendations have been implemented and evaluate the effectiveness and importance of implemented policy changes that were advocated by the Commission. Additionally, we hope to learn which unimplemented recommendations remain crucial for successful reform. This hearing was organized by research analyst Ashley Hurley, and I would like to ask her to introduce the first witness. Before you do that. Yeah. Oh, of course, Commissioner Garcetti. I think I'm not the only a commissioner who, I've, I've been here almost two years. I've never had this kind of a hearing before. Uh, first of all, I would compliment uh, the commission for having this kind of a hearing. I sit on another board where we give uh, grants to academics who are on subjects that we want um, and hope something will happen as a result of that. And we have found that unless you follow up after the research is completed and been uh, published that maybe nothing was accomplished and it was a waste of money, but you learn through that process. On the other hand, you see some things that have worked a little bit that didn't. What role do we have there? And that, as I read all the, the written um, comments that we're going to hear today that were offered, I kept asking myself, and so what? What are we expected to do about this? Because they they told us all the things that have been accomplished, but they also, I think, pointed out the big things that were not accomplished. So what? What can we do about that? We can't force anyone, but I didn't know that we were in a role, or are we in a role, where we would issue a second report saying these are some things that are uncompleted, we urge the legislature, the governor's office, et cetera, uh, to take another a hard look at it. Uh, so, and I think the people who are testifying today or hearing us need to know that this is just not an exercise on their part telling us what's happening, but there will be some kind of follow-up. I don't know what that's going to be, but maybe it is a business meeting or someplace we can discuss that in greater detail. Well, I, I wanna thank you for those uh, uh, remarks, Commissioner Garcetti. Uh, you and I, in particular, uh, know that people behave differently when there are witnesses. And I think part of the role that the commission plays is to be uh, those witnesses. And as commissioners, with the uh, authority uh, and the privilege of uh, conducting hearings and follow-up meetings and uh, having exceptionally well-trained staff who have once again presented us with an extraordinary document that has distilled so much of the work in these reports into one place, which helps focus, helps our focus, helps the uh, organizations who provide these services focus. Uh, and and I, am, I am confident will also help legislators focus on areas that uh, need to be remedied. As I read through this um, and I saw a reference to a, a, a veto uh, uh, with the explanation that the uh, legislation wanted to place certain actions in one department and the governor believed that it was already being handled by another department. The first question that came to my mind is, okay, so we get to talk to that department to find out how well they are following uh, 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 the, uh, the governor's uh, uh, recommendations and, and endorsement that those issues are being handled with that entity. So thank you for that. I think all, all the commissioners join in appreciating our role. Um, and I think the community uh, uh, appreciates the role because it is seldom that uh, folks are called back to then give us a report on what was done, uh, offer praise for success, and then uh, make uh, further admonitions on what should be done uh, to continue with growing that success. Thank you. So it's your turn. Thank you, Chair Nava, and good morning, commissioners. Our first witness today is Beth Hassett. Beth is the Chief Executive Officer and Executive Director of Sacramento-based service provider Weave, whereas she, she has led the charge to promote safe and healthy relationships and support survivors of sexual assault, domestic violence, and sex trafficking since 2006. 
Thank you for joining us. When you are ready, you may begin your testimony. Thank you. Is this on? Yes. Okay. Thank you for having me back again. Um, I provided my written testimony to staff and they can share with you. Um, I won't read all of the statistics about Weave, but um, we are one of the more than 100 um, organizations serving domestic violence victims throughout the state. Uh, we are um, specifically the county of Sacramento. And um, I've been at Weave in this role since 2006, but started at Weave in 1995. So long time in this role. Um, one thing I would like to call out, uh, just so you have a sense of the scope of Weave, our budget for this upcoming fiscal year, which starts on Sunday, is $11,222,000. And the bulk of that funding, 66% um, is, is from an array of more than 20 government grants and contracts. We raise 20% of our budget through a robust fundraising program. I can tell you that many of our sister organizations do not have as robust a fundraising effort as we do and are very reliant on, on those grant funds. Um, in addition, we have three retail stores which generate another 10% of our budget and contribute um, $30,000 a year worth of clothing to our clients. So with regard to report number one, um, getting the money to those on the front line. As I mentioned in my 2019 testimony, we find that there are many challenges and inefficiencies in state processes and requirements that could benefit from adjustments that would result in money and time savings for Weave, our sister agencies, and the state itself. In its reports, the commission recommended that the state provide funding for its key anti-domestic violence grant program through upfront payments and streamline the data reporting process. And we have seen improvements since the implementation of the commission's recommendation. Um, thanks to AB 673, this past year, for example, we received 2,100 $201,980 upfront, which was 37% of our grant subaward for our Domestic Violence Assistance Program grant. Unfortunately, this upfront payment does not apply to all of the other Cal OES grants. Um, for reference, Weave has 12 Cal OES grants right now, and so that only pertains to our Domestic Violence grant. Um, so our eight 100% VOCA funded grants, and I'm, you're going to hear a lot about VOCA today, um, we, we don't get any money up front. They also remove the quantitative data from our semi-annual progress report, which was um, one recommendation, and we now only provide qualitative narrative responses, and the numbers are reported separately up into the OVC VOCA system. And in addition, they've allowed us to move from monthly to quarterly financial reporting, which has been very helpful from a workload standpoint. But they require us to reapply for that option every time a contract is renewed, rather than just allowing us to make it a permanent change, which feels very inefficient. With regard to report number two, the findings in the January 2021 Beyond the Crisis report are very much in line with Weave's philosophy of service delivery, policy priorities, and promising practices. The recommendations all remain very relevant, although I'm not sure, given the financial outlook specifically for VOCA funding, if all of them are attainable at this moment. And it appears that minimal steps have been taken to act on many of the recommendations. My specific feedback on the findings and recommendations are as follows. Policy reforms. The need for policy reforms remains relevant and critical. The types of abuse we are seeing and the tactics used by abusers are changing as the world changes. We, we see far too many situations where there are tragic and lethal consequences, especially for victims who share children with their abuser. We need to continue learning from research and science about what poses threats to safety. For example, certain indicators are linked to increased probability of lethality, specifically the use of strangulation as an element of physical abuse, the presence of firearms in the home, and threats to kill the victim, children, or self. The state should be looking at judicial guidelines for protective orders when we know these high-risk factors are present. We still treat custody and domestic violence as separate issues, but they cannot be separated from a policy perspective. We need to acknowledge the reality that those who harm their partners are inherently also harming their children. The research and science do not support the notion that an abuser can harm their partner, but still be a good parent. 
the state should examine the training requirements and regulation of professional visitation supervisors and the safety of having non-professional people serving in that role, especially when there are risk factors present. And finally, we all need a better understanding of how emerging technologies are and will be weaponized by abu abusers. Judicial officers should receive ongoing training around technologically facilitated abuse as the world changes, and we should craft policy that ensures the safety of survivors and their families. Regarding governance, a strategic comprehensive approach to addressing domestic violence is critical to moving the needle in a meaningful way. Absent state level coordination and leadership, this kind of strategic planning will not be successful. I believe this is a complex, nuanced, and deeply rooted issue, and it requires dedicated resources and attention over a meaningful period of time. One leader of this effort will not be successful if they are under-resourced or if they are asked to manage this work along with other duties. A more specific and sustainable strategy might be to create a standing commission or advisory board to advise the governor and legislature on issues related to domestic violence. The Commission on Aging is perhaps a good model, it's a body comprised of subject matter experts who have the directive to advocate for older adults and advise the state on issues that impact older adults. Coupled with this could be a standing joint policy committee at the legislature level, which would review and provide input on new policies in any area that might have consequences for survivors. Because too often we see well-intentioned legislation enacted that has unintended consequences for survivors because the policy was never considered through the lens of its impact on that group. With regard to the recommendation that the state create a framework for data collection and analysis, I would suggest leveraging the data the state already has to inform the strategic goals and future programming. The state collects massive amounts of data from funding recipients, but does not appear to compile or analyze any of it. Regarding prevention and early intervention, prevention and early intervention efforts are critical to the continuum of addressing domestic violence and are illustrative of why a strategic comprehensive approach is needed. And they must make sense with the rest of the continuum which spans education, prevention, early intervention, crisis response, and all of the interventions that are called for in state statutes such as counseling, emergency shelter, legal assistance, and tangible supports such as transportation, food, and clothing. As noted in recommendation number one, while the government funding for prevention work is woefully inadequate, we can't simply swap intervention funding for an investment in prevention. We must prioritize and fund these efforts in addition. I believe it's critical that leaders in the state of California take the stance that violence is in fact preventable. When we fail to believe that to be true, we rely on the fear and punishment-based strategies that are currently in place. We need to pivot to multi-generational approaches and community-driven solutions to support healthy relationships. The solution includes incorporating education about healthy relationships, conflict resolution, and safety into mainstream learning to ensure that we are reaching the broadest population possible. If children are not learning about healthy relationships in their home environment, we need to teach this elsewhere. We don't expect every parent to teach their child chemistry without the support of an educator. Why would this topic be any different? Firearms. With regard to firearms, SB 320 strengthens the process for removing guns from those with domestic violence restraining orders. This was a meaningful step forward in this effort, but the reality is firearm relinquishment is still largely disjointed and relies on an honor system in many cases. State level efforts are important, but local agencies are often best suited to address these situations quickly. They need to be incentivized to prioritize this work, perhaps by attaching conditions to funding or devising other prioritization methods that make it clear this is critical to the safety of victims, community members, and officers alike. Economic security, I applaud efforts to increase the understanding of all leaders at all levels of government to better understand the intersection of domestic violence and homelessness. We should be looking for solutions that prioritize people who want to be housed rather than focusing the greatest number of resources on those who do not. Certainly those experiencing chronic homelessness need supports and services, but the victims and survivors who seek refuge at WEAVE and other agencies want to be housed and often don't qualify for programs designed to serve this other subset of our unhoused community. 
They are staying in dangerous homes because they do not have the resources, skills, and freedom to find a safe place to live. They're a hidden group of people experiencing homelessness, and we have a strong infrastructure in place in this state to help them if only we had the funds. If I might, if I might step in here for just yes. a Commissioner Beyer. Uh, hmm? has, Commissioner Beyer has a question yes. for you. Uh, thank you very much for your comprehensive testimony. Uh, let me start by seeing if I can summarize your testimony so I make sure I get it right. We did a very good job in our earlier reports. Some of those recommendations have been implemented, but not enough. Um, less money than you would like is available. The Victims of Crime Act reduction at the federal level is a big problem. And there are specific steps that you think we should recommend in a subsequent report. Have I got that right? That is correct. Okay. So um, in reverse order of what you testified about, um, one component that I was exposed to yesterday was um, I heard a speech by a researcher at UCSF, um, Margot Kuschel, uh, who wrote the most comprehensive report about homelessness. And um, she makes the same point you did about domestic violence and intimate partner violence and homelessness, and that most people tend to not think about that but the percentages and the numbers were staggering um, and worth special focus. So um, I'm assuming that one of the things that you're contemplating in your recommendation about a state commission based on the Commission on Aging is that issues like that, that are either neglected or underemphasized could be brought together in a whole of government approach if you had such a commission Whereas if you were just dealing with domestic violence um, at the departmental level or at the local level, it might not surface to a statewide whole of government approach. Is that a fair summary? Absolutely. And we see lots of funding that to the average person, I mean, lots of policy that to the average person, you wouldn't even think domestic violence victims would be affected by it. But if you run it through that lens, it's like, oh, for instance, there was this electronic um, license plate proposal, and we met with the folks who were proposing that, and we said, do you see that the abuser would have all sorts of access to where this car is, and and it wouldn't be safe for somebody who's a domestic violence victim? And he's like, oh, I hadn't even thought about that. So I think there are lots of things like that, especially when it comes to technology, using technology, and um and other matters that nobody nobody's looking at it through that lens, honestly, unless somebody happens to call the partnership or call me or um, we get wind of it. So yes, I do think there needs to be a comprehensive um, approach. And I was shocked. We had one of the governor's home key projects. So we built nine permanent supportive housing units and the um, secretary of, I guess, housing came and toured. And she said, I'd never thought about domestic violence victims being part of the homeless community. And I'm like, well, that's shocking to me. So yeah, I really think there's some kind of a huge disconnect there that needs to be brought together. And also in this imaginary commission, um, they could address the issues that you raised about technological abuse or the application of artificial intelligence in an abusive way. Um, and also the necessity of following up on um, our earlier recommendations about data collection and requiring and overseeing that the data is actually used. Um, former President Obama had a way of describing things. Don't do stupid stuff. If you're going to collect data, you should use it and you should measure how useful the data is. And if it isn't useful, you shouldn't collect it. And I think that's pretty much what you've said. Well, and in 2019, I said, we collect a lot of data and deliver it. And I don't know that anybody ever looks at it. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Sidley, Anand uh, Garcetti. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony and your, your written testimony and all the work you do. I'd like to just echo actually what you're talking about in terms of training, uh, how things are changing. I've had the opportunity of late to work with uh, Dr. Edie Zussman. She is a renowned expert on, she's a neurosurgeon 
and she is doing unbelievable work about traumatic brain injury, domestic violence victims. I have been on the edges of domestic violence uh, studies work. I was with the Violence Against Women Office in the Clinton administration. And only after speaking with Dr. Zussman have we started talking about that connection of traumatic brain injury on domestic violence victims. And I bring this up because you specifically called out training for judicial officers. Well, many times, one of the aspects of somebody who has TBI is a, they would be a terrible witness. They don't remember what's happening. They don't know what's happening. Uh, and it takes time to recover. Uh, often if a police officer or somebody would come to a house about a domestic violence uh, situation, uh, the uh, victim might be confused, uh, might be wearing sunglasses, might be doing things, which if it was a football player, you might recognize that they have the outset concussion where we do not recognize that in a domestic violence victim or a intimate partner victim. So I raise that to add to your testimony of how much it is vital that we continue to do research, that we continue to apply science to this issue, because often, um, and I'll speak, it's not all women, uh, only women who are victims, there are men who are victims, but in many cases, it, the woman is looked upon as somebody who is just not capable of handling the family. Uh, we cannot send the children home with, with the woman victim because she's confused. She's um, just not able to remember appointments, things like that. And we never take into account that there could be a traumatic brain injury there. And so I just, um, I just raised that. I think it's important to get that on the record. I, I do recommend for, if anybody doesn't know Dr. Edie Zussman uh, and her work, I recommend that you do go look into it uh, because really what she is working on is extraordinary. And uh, is she's been working with the County of Los Angeles. She's been working with uh, Chicago police officers, um, sort of a one woman force, although she's now been partnering up with numerous people. And so it's not just her, but that was my introduction to, to this issue. So I just raised that as part of, to echo what you're saying about how the science is so important, training is continuing to be important. And that coupled on other recommendations that we made that maybe somebody hasn't picked up on or something, but I, I did want to put that out there. So thank you. She's brilliant. We've been trying to find money to work together for over a year. And one of her simple recommendations is that if somebody has a brain injury, that they be allowed to go somewhere for 10 days and heal their brain. Because what happens is they go back into that situation. You like putting the football player back in the game and he gets hit again and you get hit too many times and it's permanent damage. So that's exactly the kind of thing. And unfortunately, since the judicial system is a black box. I don't know how they get trained. I don't know who trains them. I don't know what ongoing um, education judges have. Um, I feel it's really important that somebody who has control over that ensure that they're getting the training and the information they need to make really sound decisions for victims. Thank you. Commissioner Garcetti. Ms. Hassett, thank you very much for taking the time and making the effort of appearing in person. Uh, it's much more effective, as much as I love Zoom, to hear and see and feel you know, the people who are uh, behind the words. So thank you for doing that. Number one question I have is why do you refer to it as domestic violence as opposed to family violence? You know, we all debate that in the field, just like are they survivors or are they victims? Um, you know, we use domestic violence because it's the term people generally use and know. And honestly, I think when people get into inter, um, interpersonal violence and even family violence, it starts bringing in, well, what if it's the son and the mother and the, you know, all, all of that, I think it's confusing to people, but um, we will go with the will of the world <laughs> that we, we use. Well, I, I, I'm suggesting to you that I think, uh, people can be educated that this is not just an adult who's being victimized, their children. Uh, no reason that you should know that I was a district attorney in Los Angeles, and this was my number one issue, was what I then referred to as domestic violence. You, you did. But then I learned 
that I believe it was 63% of all people in prisons throughout California are victims of family violence. And I'll give you one situation, and I don't know if it ever applied to one of yours, but my guess is you still have some difficulty convincing uh, victims of family violence to step forward, to go through the entire process. They're reluctant, they're afraid my yeah, it's going to get blown off. They're going to take the kids. I don't have any money, et cetera, all of that. So good reasons, but at the end, on the day that the O.J. Simpson case ended, I made a deal with the network. So I'd answer all the questions about that case, but I want separate time to focus on the issue of domestic family violence. And they held to that. And I talked to them the way I'm talking to you right now. If you are a mother and you're here as a victim because you're listening, you've been victimized by this. Yes, you have to be concerned about yourself, but you really have to be concerned about any children that you have. Because as they grow up, women say, well, I guess that's the role of a woman. You take this abuse, both the mental abuse and the physical abuse. For the boy, well, this is the role of a man. You know, you keep him in charge. You have to hit him around maybe sometimes and yell at him and scream at him, but that's the role of a man in doing it. And I said, don't do that because there is such a thing as a cycle of violence. Help break the cycle of violence. Help break it right now. Do you want your son or daughter to be in the same situation as you are as an adult? And that was basically my message. There was more to it than then. Three days after I received a phone call from a mother who is in a shelter in Kansas City, Missouri. She said, we all were watching the verdict. And I was there with my two children because here, man, this is, this is a big case, all about domestic violence. When, we heard, when I heard the verdict, I told my kids, pack up, we're going home. My thinking was, if they can't get a guilty verdict in that case, they're never going to get one in my case because it's one against one. They didn't have any other evidence. It's just my word against it, and the kids couldn't testify. So I went back and started packing, and then I heard that you were going to be talking about this issue. There was a commercial break. She came back, and she heard this and said, after I heard your words, I looked at my children and I thought to myself, I owe it to them, not just to me, but to them. And so we're going to stay here. We're going to testify. I don't know if you could ever use that example in convincing someone. But if you talk about that cycle of violence, most people probably on this panel are not aware how many people in prisons were victims of, the, of family violence. It's both the mental as well as the physical. Bottom line for me, for your testimony today, because I was not a commissioner when you first testified, is that you need the continuing state financial support. Without that, we're gonna have more victims of domestic violence. By more, I'm not just talking about a woman, I'm talking about her children involved. To the extent that we can do something, I certainly will be an advocate for that. So thank you for coming forward. Well, and we know that hurt people hurt people. Yes. And if we're not addressing these largely young men who are going to grow up to be perpetrators, we're we're never going to move the needle Indeed. ever. So Thank I appreciate you. you. Thank you. Commissioner Ariner. I know you look very tiny there. <laughs> so, there we go. Great, thank you. Good morning and, and thank you so much. It's good to see you again. Um, I wanted to get back to this issue of a commission, that, that kind of idea, having been around for quite a while and watching the Commission on Aging in particular, right? Um, you know, it's, at least it's my perception that the commission um, didn't, play, didn't play a major role until this governor actually decided, right, that we needed a master plan on aging and long-term care. 
And all of us, and part of that was, is because the idea was that it was cross agency, right? That be, because old people are in, you know, affected by almost every agency in the state of California. And it's made a significant, um, it's played a significant role. We just did a, we just did a, a study on the master plan for aging um, to see where it's going, what's happening with it. They have like 280 recommendations and where are they in fulfilling that in a 10 year plan. But um, I, I don't know of a sitting commission, right? I think the first recommendation that we made last time was around doing, you know, having um, a, a central place, right? That there had to be somebody in charge because what we've noticed is there's nobody in charge. It doesn't mean that they aren't caring and they're not doing whatever it is, but it's not in sync with each other, that kind of thing. And so I, the question is whether or not we want to stick with our original proposal, which was, you know, let's get everybody in order here, right? Let's have somebody, somebody and lead agency who has to take responsibility, right? And to be sure to bring every, all those other agencies together. Just interested in, does it matter what it's called or anything like that? I really think the issue is, is how do we get the state agencies together? And then, but the other part of a commission is, is that you do bring in um, people from the outside. So maybe there's some way to do it um, jointly, right? Mm -hmm. So that we can figure out ways to bring the experts in at the same time we're trying to organize the state agencies um, to do their part. And then the other thing was, we talked about funding last time for sure, that um, it's a measly budget, right? That the state puts in, um, not let, let alone what comes from the feds. Um, but what do we do about that to, to figure out how are we gonna, because if we don't finance this, um, you know, in, in a more rich way, right? Um, I think we're still gonna be spinning our wheels. I think it's critical that it be multi-sector and bring in lots of voices. I, I, we've got a pilot program where we're looking at how we can better serve the Black community in South Sacramento. Mm -hmm. And we've been successful because we brought not the usual suspects to the table and really listened to communities and listened to people who are experiencing violence in ways that people like me would not know unless we listen and pay attention. And I think that's part of the solution. And I, I really feel that just having one entity over it, we're not going to get anywhere. We already have the DVAC, which um, you know gives advice to Cal OES. But again, it's a bunch of me sitting around the table and I don't have all the solutions and we're all so entrenched in what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. I don't know that we're the best people to lift up to you know, 100 miles above and look down on it and talk about meaty and meaningful solutions that um, are probably lurking there and we just haven't seen them yet. Yeah, my theory is that usually the communities that are impacted are the best place to go and ask them what needs to be done. Absolutely, and we need we need more community-driven strategies. Yeah. We absolutely do, because what we've been doing, I think, has done a good job of keeping the people for whom things have hit the fan safe. But um, if they've come to us and if we can keep them safe, and it's the tip of the iceberg of the number of people who need help. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, not to you, but to staff. Um, if we could take a look at, uh, as an example, the Commission on Aging, uh, and how much does that cost? Because I think when we talk about a, a, a commission like you're discussing, one of the first things that pops up in some people's minds is what does it cost and how do we pay for it? And it makes sense if we're reviewing the recommendations for us to have that kind of information. And thank you, thank you for your testimony. One other just um, follow up on one of the recommendations about the CalWORKs vouchers. I asked my staff about them. They just got the flyer last week. So something has happened, but it happened last week. So I think as you as you go through the recommendations, it seems like that one has at least been started. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Hurley, we have, I know we have uh, other witnesses and I would suggest to our commissioners Take care of your microphone. Can you want? Yeah. It, it's, okay. it's a bad button. Uh, okay. I believe if we turn it off, it may not come back on. All so right, perhaps right, we'll right. just okay. leave on Commissioner Ariner's microphone. Our next witness this morning is Eric Morrison Smith. Eric is the executive director for the Alliance for Boys and Men of Color, where he works with network partners to build power to change systems and transform the material conditions of black people, indigenous people, and people of color. Thank you for joining us. When you're ready, you may begin your testimony. 
Good morning, Chair and Commissioners. Um, before getting started, I just first off want to apologize. I'm getting over a bad bout of allergies. You could probably hear the nasaliness. Uh, so just <laughs> want to apologize that you got to deal with my nasally voice for the next um, 10 minutes or so. Uh, but my name is Eric Morrison Smith. I'm the Executive Director of the Alliance of Boys and Men of Color, which is a network of 200 organizations across California coming together to advance race and gender justice and transform policies and systems that are harming our families and our communities. As an organization dedicated to racial and gender justice, we have been working to reduce, prevent, and ultimately end intimate partner violence in California. And more than 100 racial and gender justice organizations have joined our Healing Together campaign to foster healing-centered, innovative, and effective solutions to address intimate partner violence. We work to engage men and people of all genders to build up communities, shift our responses to violence away from shame and punishment, and highlight alternative approaches and equitable policy solutions that move us towards healing. The commission has made strong recommendations to invest in prevention, provide holistic support, and improve interventions. However, since the publication of the commission's report, significant barriers and challenges remain. The state of California has failed to make investments and policy changes needed to adequately respond to, prevent, and end cycles of gender-based violence. One key recommendation from this report was for California to adopt a comprehensive, all-government approach to ending um, and preventing intimate partner violence by creating a coordinated office to oversee state responses, which has already been part of the conversation this morning. Um, ABMOC worked with over 100 community-based uh, serving and domestic violence organizations to advocate for stable funding of prevention programs and for the creation of a coordinated leadership position for domestic violence. Unfortunately, the state failed yet again to create any meaningful investments in disrupting and preventing violence. This budget ask would have provided the necessary funding for domestic and sexual violence organizations to continue offering prevention and education services and would have expanded efforts to develop innovative and culturally rooted interventions. Moreover, we lobbied for the creation of a unified senior advisor on violence prevention for the state within one of its public health agencies. As the commission identified in its report, the state lacks a cohesive and unified response to intimate partner violence, which has dampened its ability to create enduring change. By failing to make significant investments in violence prevention and intervention, California is falling behind national efforts to address intimate partner violence. This spring, the White House released a national plan to end gender-based violence. The plan calls for a comprehensive whole of government and intersectional approach to ending domestic violence. The plan outlines the importance of focusing on prevention efforts, as well as wraparound services for people experiencing harm. The commission also called on the state to take a closer look at the batter intervention programs, BIPs, and related systems to ensure that they offer true rehabilitative and healing services and that barriers to entering the programs are reduced. Since the port was released, the Alliance has worked with dozens of committee organizations to petition the state auditor to review and assess BIPs their efficacies, and the ways of improving program delivery. The auditor's report released last October found that there are significant oversight and monitoring failures in part by the probation departments and that none of the probation departments included in the study had mechanisms in place to ensure compliance with state law. In the legislature, recent efforts to reform the BIP system have suggested shifting the responsibility of oversight from probation departments to the Department of Justice. The Alliance for Boys and Men of Color, in partnership with the California Partnership to End Domestic Violence, has expressed strong concern about this proposal. Instead, we call for the oversight of these programs to be placed within a state agency with ep expertise in public health approaches to ending violence, and that California follow the best practices from other states, including holistic supports and equitable funding of programs. As noted in the Little Hillwood uh, Commission report, the state should remove its requirements for better intervention programs to determine if they facilitate rehabilitation. Additionally, the state should begin a process to determine how to tailor rehabilitative services to an individual's needs. Finally, the state should ensure that rehabilitation is not contingent on, on an individual's ability to pay. So that was a quote directly from the report. We were also disappointed to see the legislature not pass AB 1028 which would have eliminated requirements that healthcare providers notify law enforcement of a broad range of injuries related to domestic violence and would have ensured that victims of domestic violence get referred to domestic violence supports and increase autonomy and access to much needed healthcare. 
For women of, who are experiencing violence, but especially Black women, immigrant women, and other marginalized groups who do not access critical support due to fear of having to engage with law enforcement. Similarly, we, were, we saw that the governor vetoed AB 1306, which is another bill that we co-sponsored along with AB 1028, the HOME Act, which had provisions that would have created additional protection for immigrants who were arrested for or convicted of a nonviolent event committed while they were a victim of human trafficking, domestic violence, or sexual violence. While we are concerned that the legislature is failing to make evidence-based transformations to the BIP system and other issues related to intimate partner violence, policymakers have listened to community-based advocates and implemented two critical policy changes related to intimate partner violence. First, California has renewed and expanded the Breaking Barriers to Employment Act to ensure that workforce development opportunities are inclusive of those who are victims of intimate partner violence or at risk of causing harm. And second, California is launching a grant program that will invest in police-free, community-based responses to a variety of emergencies, including intimate partner violence. It was a recommendation of the Little Hoover Commission's support to expand the Removing Barriers to Employment Act and explicitly include victims of domestic violence. Through our advocacy efforts with the California Immigrant Policy Center, California Workforce Association, and creating restorative opportunities, um, we were able to secure an additional 35 million over three years and ensure that community-based organizations serving persons who are victims of domestic violence or community violence can also access the funds and provide holistic and healing-centered supports. In 2021, the legislature also passed the Crisis Act, AB 118, which established a pilot program for community-centered alternatives to law enforcement. With investments and in programs like this, victims of violence are able to get healing-centered support from trained professionals, and it helps California lead the way in building community-based infrastructure that actually keeps our community safe. While these two policy advancements are important steps forward, the state response remains alarmingly inadequate given the severity of the crisis. More must be done to provide culturally rooted, healing-centered responses to partner violence for all people, including those using violence. Research shows that Californians are ready for more innovative approaches to end intimate partner violence and believe that it is a problem that we must collectively address. Eight in 10 support alternatives to jail for people who cause domestic violence, including counseling or restitution. And two thirds feel domestic violence is a public issue that should be addressed by all of us. It is time for California's policymakers to listen to Californians, survivors and advocates and implement a holistic state re response that meets the urgency of the crisis. As California policymakers repeatedly ignore best practices from other states and the federal government, the experience and expertise of those who work every day to foster safety and healing and growing public concern. Generations of Californians will continue to be subjected to the harm and trauma of partner violence. We are grateful to the Little Hoover Commission for the continued focus on this issue and efforts to ensure California makes the prevention and intervention investments needed to end cycles of intimate partner violence. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Let me turn to the Commissioner Beyer. I see your microphone. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Um, in the uh, imaginative, perhaps incorrect uh, assumption that one of the things that you're seeking to address is the potential overreaction of using law enforcement at all times for all solutions. Uh, that is called 911. Um, we now have a new mental health hotline, 988. Yeah, that's right. And maybe you could uh, help us understand how that opportunity to send teams of well-trained uh, psychologists, social workers, and peers to a, a location could be a useful thing if there has been differentiation between the potential for violence in real time where you need law enforcement yeah. versus a longer term uh, drug addiction, alcohol addiction, or um, long simmering uh, emotional abuse situation. I know that that would be very difficult for the person who's answering the phone at 988, but um, I know in Los Angeles, they're using 988 to send teams of people into um, uh, more situations than were was available in the past. And the funding for 988, in addition to the federal money, is also coming from the telephone companies uh, as a result of a legislative deal. 
um, which actually seems like it's stable because California is the only state that has fully funded 988. So maybe you could comment on the viability of 988 and how it would fit into the vision that you laid out. Yeah, absolutely. So one thing is um, 988 and this bill that I'm talking about were actually passed the same year. Um, and one big difference is, you know, part of the reason why we advanced this issue is we're already seeing community-based organizations who are responding to these issues around intimate partner violence, but aren't getting any funding to do it. And one critical piece of funding uh, community-based organizations to do this type of work is in many cases, they have the best understanding of the culture of the community. You know, they know who the neighbors are um, and are able to de-escalate these situations in ways that other entities can't. So I think, you know, the critical piece of building out this type of in infrastructure is really ensuring that we have folks who, you know, have the expertise to respond to these emergency situations, um, but are also um, in relationship with the people that they're responding to um, and, you know, are actually at the same time building up that type of community-based infrastructure that we know our communities really need. Um, in terms of 9A8, you know, I'm excited to see that we have um, an alternative system that we're getting ready to build out. Um, I honestly haven't been tracking the implementation of that so far because I've been working so deeply on um, the Crisis Act. But I think the vision is that we build out um, a diversity of different programs and infrastructure that could actually, you know, respond to different types of scenarios. Well, um, if, if I could offer a suggestion, then yeah. uh, I would reach out to the folks in Los Angeles County, and I'm sure Commissioner Garcetti would be helpful in making introductions, um, because I think start with a hard place and prove it can be done. And one thing that you could, I think, do is help train the people who are answering the phone um, so that they do have that cultural sensitivity that you're talking about and know by neighborhood. Um, so one of the early problems um, with 988, and this is one of those don't do stupid stuff, um, it's predicated on the area code of the phone. So if you've moved here from Chicago, your call would go to Chicago. Yeah. And it's going to take a, a bill, Tony Cardenas's bill, for Congress to change that rule, as stupid as that rule is. So one of the things that I think an organization like yours could do is bring that kind of cultural uh, awareness to the people who are answering the phone and provide perhaps lists of uh, organizations who could do some follow-up from a phone call so that there's some continuity and a fabric of care over time. Yeah, most definitely. I appreciate that recommendation. And and one thing I should have um, been more clear about is some of these programs already exist specifically in Oakland and Sacramento um, and have proven to be effective and more cost effective than other alternatives as well. Uh, so the idea behind this pilot program is finally giving them the much needed state funding that they need. Um, so they don't have to scrap by with um, philanthropy dollars or community dollars to be able to provide that type of um, service. But yeah, I, I appreciate that recommendation. We'll definitely follow up. Commissioner Garcetti. Commissioner Morrison Smith, thank you for, for being here. An easy question first, uh, maybe may more difficult later, but uh, first question, where is uh, your office located in Los Angeles? Uh, so we're a statewide organization. Um, we have staff all over the place. Um, so I just actually moved from Oakland to Long Beach. Um, but my, you know, we have people in Los Angeles, a couple in San Diego, Sacramento, all across the state. Um, but the organizations that are a part of our network are all grassroots organizations and maybe a mix of some lawyers and whatnot all across the state as well. Okay. I, I knew you were a statewide organization, but I didn't realize the diffuse uh, nature of that. For example, in Los Angeles, is there a person in charge of, the, of that organization there in Los Angeles as opposed to a different community? Uh, no, I'm the uh, executive director the boss of, of the whole all thing, of it, I guess. The whole yeah. thing. All right. So my second question is a little more difficult uh, than perhaps than I, I imagined. One of your chief concerns is simply finance again, yeah, continuing uh, California support state yeah. support and you do that by getting legislators in the governor's office uh and the attorney general's office on your side and picking up on where commissioner Breyer was talking about and that is show them what you can do yeah i mean do you have examples for example in los angeles of but for your organization you know the 
bad things would have happened. We can show you where we have made a difference. Before you answer that, let me ask you, how do you define boys? How do we define boys? Yeah, um, and by boys, age group, age group. Yeah, so, I mean, it depends on the issue that we're looking at. In many cases, we're talking about, you know, young people who are between the ages of 16 and 24. But for our work, we're thinking about it in a holistic way. So we're thinking about, you know, very young boys who are in kindergarten um, all the way up to, you know, adulthood. Well, I compliment you on that because most of us probably know that when the public hears about the dropout rate, yeah, it's actually quite misleading because the dropout rate only focuses on high school. So you have to begin high school before they show the dropout rate. They don't show the dropout rates in the sixth grade and certainly in middle school. And that's huge. Yeah. That's absolutely huge. Uh, if you can show that you're focusing on that particular issue, just keeping kids in school. I can give you an example. I grew up in South Central Los Angeles, and I have a close relationship with that school. There was one young man who came to interview me with three other young people from the school. And this guy was razor sharp. He was in the fifth grade. I mean, smart. Yeah. He asked good questions. When I tried to throw him off, he would bring me back throw them off, bring me back. It, it was really good. When we finished, uh, the teacher who was with him said, he's really smart. Said, we think he has the IQ of a genius. We don't know for sure, but he is really smart. But he has problems at home. He dropped out of school at the beginning of the sixth grade. I mean, that's a loss, not just to his family, but to society. Here's a person that could have contributed something so if you can show examples of what you have done and then show a particular member of the assembly or the Senate or the governor's office, this is what we have been able to accomplish, but we need the finances and the financial support to do it. We're all ahead. Yeah. So good luck. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you so much. And just a couple of quick things. Um, I definitely agree with what you're saying. Um, you know, right now we're really talking about the work that the Alliance does around intimate partner violence, but we work on a variety of issues um, from apprenticeships. And we're thinking about how domestic violence uh, intersects with that issue. But we also do a lot of work around education equity, um, community schools. The state made the biggest investment of $4.1 billion for that grant. Um, and we actually submitted a letter that talked about how community violence intersects with community um, schools and how we could be thinking about providing healing services and prevention services, both for the families and for the students to ensure that, you know, people are getting the, the need um, support that they need. And then the second piece um, on proving the concept, I think one thing that I should just make sure to mention is that the state did make an investment of $10 million in the community um, based alternatives. And part of the reason why the governor felt comfortable doing that is because some community organizations have already been doing this work and have proven that their programs are effective. But again, like I, I agree that part of the information that we'll get from this pilot program is there's extensive evaluation to ensure that the programs are working effectively. Um, and if they do prove that, then we'll be able to advocate for more resources for these types of community-based infrastructure. I just have a, a, a very quick question, and I thank you for coming and, and uh, visiting with us again. Do you, Does your organization or part of your uh, extended organizations uh, work with homeboys and do gang-related work? Yeah, yes, ma'am. Um, we actually just hosted an event because we work on a variety of different legislation. Every year we co-sponsor and um, work hardly with our coalition partners on around 12 different pieces of legislation. And we actually hosted an event with Homeboy Industries on AB 958, which would have, um, you know, created more protections for uh, people who are incarcerated and making sure that we keep families connected. So we have connected with them. Um, they're actually a part of our network. And um it's a relationship that we should probably build stronger, but we've at least done some um, engagements in the last year. Yeah. Any uh, further questions, comments from commission? Yep. Seeing none, I wanna thank you very much for your work and thank you very much uh, for joining us today and offering uh, your perspective, your testimony and your recommendations and indicating those sorts of things that are successful and then helping point us in the direction of what else we need to advocate for. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your time.
Our next witness this morning is Krista Cologne. Krista is the Senior Director of Public Policy Strategies for the California Partnership to End Domestic Violence, where she oversees the organization's legislative budget and systems change advocacy. Thank you for joining us. When you're ready, please begin your testimony. Good morning, commissioners. Thank you so much for hosting today's hearing. It has been an eventful few years since we last saw you all in person. And I'm glad to be able to be with you today to provide some updates on progress that has been made and provide some recommendations on where we can continue to strengthen the state's response to domestic violence. I wanna start with prevention and some good news as well as some continuing areas of challenge. Um, in 2021, the state provided $15 million in one-time funding to support domestic and sexual violence prevention programs. Um, this followed several years of smaller one-time investments and has allowed the state currently to support- can you, Krista, can you move the mic just a little okay. bit closer and perhaps speak up a little bit? Thank you so much. Sure. Is that better? Okay. I think so. Um, the $15 million provided in 2021 is currently supporting 46 community-based organizations across the state in implementing prevention efforts designed to really stop violence from ever occurring and change those conditions on the ground that often lead to violence. You heard earlier in Beth's testimony when she spoke about the importance of healthy relationship education. That's often one of the activities that's part of these prevention grants. Unfortunately, those grants will end soon. That $15 million will conclude. Um, in 2022, the state budget did not provide any prevention funding. And in 2023, in the budget that was just completed, the state provided only $2.3 million which we believe Cal OES will be able to use to provide a short extension in the grants. The current grants were set to end in April of 2024. And so we're hopeful that the extension of those grants using the small dollar amount in this year's budget will get us through the next 2024 budget cycle and allow for the opportunity for continued advocacy to continue those funds. However, I must name that the one-time nature of funding and prevention, the instability of the dollar amounts, and the uncertainty that it creates for programs leads to real instability in their ability to be effective in their communities at building the long-term relationships and meaningful work that we know is needed to ultimately prevent violence. So we are continuing to um, urge the legislature and this administration to consider ongoing, continuous, stable investments into prevention. However, when we think about prevention, we are also looking at broader societal level um, issues that can lead to violence occurring and steps that we can take to prevent violence. And this includes economic security. We know that when we increase economic stability and security within families, we can reduce the likelihood of violence. So at the partnership, we work closely with the California Work and Family Coalition. And through that coalition, they have seen great strides made on strengthening California's paid family leave program. Um, which provides paid leave to individuals when they need to take time off from work to care for themselves or a loved one to welcome a new child into the family, which can be a particularly stressful time and lead to a rise in violence. So we have seen the job protections um, expanded to workplaces with five or more employees. We've seen an expansion of the wage replacement rate, making sure that when low-income workers and really all workers are taking time off, that they're receiving a higher percentage of their wages during that time. Because we know that for families that are paycheck to paycheck when working, taking a leave that would have you only receiving 60% of your wages is simply not tenable. So we've been able to see some really exciting improvements there. Um, there are also two pending bills in front of the governor, AB 524, to prohibit um, discrimination against employees based on their family caregiver status, and AB 575 to make a range of improvements to the California Paid Family Leave Program, um, both of which we see as important not only for survivors of violence, but also as preventative measures on a broad societal level. 
when we think about prevention as well, one area of focus that we have in mind for upcoming work is follow up on implementation from the California Healthy Youth Act, legislation that passed several years to address California's health education um, and include requirements around healthy relationship education. Um, we are looking forward to um, taking a deep dive across the state to see how that work is going um, and make sure that the healthy relationship education components are being implemented in a way that's meaningful for students all across the state of California. I also want to touch briefly on economic security and housing as a component of that. Um, not only are the paid family leave bills that I mentioned a preventative approach for us, they're also an important economic security approach. In, in additional work with the California Work and Family Coalition, we've been proud to support SB 616, which is currently pending in front of the governor, um, a bill which would expand California's paid sick days requirement, increasing the required number of days from three to five days. Most notably and most relevant for the population that we are considered is that these sick days are also paid safe days. California state law already provides um, job protected time off for survivors to go to court, engage in safety planning, engage with criminal and legal proceedings. And survivors can use their paid sick days for that time. It's explicitly called out in the statute. So when we expand the number of paid sick days, we're also expanding the number of paid safe days so that survivors who have left an abusive situation when rely on their wages to be able to make ends meet for their family can take that time off to engage in the criminal legal, the civil legal, safety planning, counseling for themselves or their children and do so without losing wages. We also have had the privilege of co-sponsoring legislation over the past few years to address an issue of what we call coerced debt. And these are the debts that an abusive partner will threaten and coerce the survivor into taking out during an abusive relationship. We see economic abuse occurring in nearly 99% of all domestic violence cases. It's incredibly prevalent. And this is one particular component, right? Abusive partners will say, we need to put the car in your name, you have the better credit score, or we're going to buy this and you pay for it, or you put the loan in your name, I'll pay it off. And then those debts don't get paid off. And then the survivor is facing debt collections. And so we have worked on a couple of bills. So AB 2517 in 2021 created a process so that um, judges in domestic violence restraining order cases can indicate that the debt, some of the debts were coerced um, and were a result of the economic abuse, providing some documentation that survivors can use when going to their creditors and seeking some remedies. SB, I'm sorry, SB 975 by Senator Min, um, which passed and just recently went into effect, creates a broader structure for survivors to address coerced debt providing remedies for them to be able to address those directly with the creditors, um, the same way that you know individuals experiencing identity theft may be able to, as well as a court process if it can't be resolved directly with the creditor. That bill has just recently gone into effect, and so we're anxious and hopeful to see um, some shifts in survivors' economic security as a result. Um, Beth, on the topic of homelessness and housing. Um, Beth, in her testimony, spoke about the need to continue to connect the dots between what are too often seen as siloed issues, but are truly interconnected issues. We know that nationally 50% of survivors of domestic violence, sorry, 50% of unhoused women report domestic violence as an immediate cause of their homelessness. This is a key intersection. Um, and just last year, two partnership bills, partnership sponsored bills were able to pass to address housing, homelessness, and domestic violence. On the tenant protection side, SB 1017 passed to strengthen California's eviction protections for survivors of domestic violence to hopefully keep more survivors safely housed and reduce their um, risk of eviction from their homes. 
And on the homelessness system front, SB 914 by Senator Rubio passed to better incorporate the needs of domestic violence survivors and unaccompanied women experiencing homelessness into both the state's planning around homelessness and also at the local level into the continuums of care and county level decision making around homelessness. Um, to better make sure that data about this population is captured, that survivors of domestic violence and the victim service providers serving this population are incorporated into the planning, goal setting, and decision making about how communities and the state is approaching domestic violence and approaching homelessness as a whole. This remains a core area of work for the partnership. We're excited to work on the implementation of SB 914 and work on a broad range of housing issues because this is so central to the needs of survivors. Much of the work of domestic violence service providers is housing based. Um, the domestic violence shelters, which I know many of you are familiar with as a structure, are emergency shelters and they are homeless service providers. But domestic violence service providers provide a range of other housing activities, helping survivors navigate available housing resources in their community and secure new residences, um, providing transitional housing, implementing a model that we call domestic violence housing first, and really providing as much wraparound services as possible. Unfortunately, this is where I have to talk about the looming funding cuts that I know um, Beth alluded to, but I want to provide a greater level of detail. So one of the big risks that we see on the horizon for the domestic violence field and for progress to many of the goals named in these reports is that at the federal level, a funding source known as the Victims of Crime Act has been diminishing greatly. The Victims of Crime Act is a non-taxpayer fund at the federal level funded through criminal fines and fees. Um, and every year, Congress gets to set the amount to release from this fund. Congress has kept that fund balance or kept that annual release quite low, and the balance had built up in the fund. In 2015, they began releasing a higher amount of funding, um, which has been amazingly impactful for the field. California is the largest state, receives the largest dollar amount of this fund. And with the new dollars that came to California, we've been able to implement transitional housing on a meaningful basis. We've been able to implement domestic violence housing first. We've been able to fund a wide range of crime victim services that goes far beyond domestic violence. However, the fund balance has diminished. Um, and despite efforts to legislatively address this at the federal level, which are working, but working far slower than we would like, um, the releases from Congress have not been able to keep up with the level that we need. In California in 2021, the state provided a $100 million backfill um, to keep victim services here in California stable. Unfortunately, the Office on Emergency Services has notified their Victims of Crime Act Steering Committee um, that they are once again looking at the likelihood of a great reduction um, in what's available from the federal level and reductions that could necessitate um, some serious cuts. Um, the Steering Committee has worked with Cal OES on analyzing this and providing input and recommendations from the field. And I really want to commend the Office of Emergency Services for raising this issue early. Um, they are concerned about what may happen in the next state fiscal year, so next July, if the situation does not change. And while that means that I know many in the field are incredibly concerned and anxious now, um, on a policy level, it gives us time to advocate for solutions. We have been advocating quite a bit at the congressional level. However, as I sit here on September 28th, I think everyone is aware that the moment there is no congressional budget done um, and the likelihood looming of a potential shutdown um, rather than a finalized budget. So we will continue our congressional advocacy um, continue to look for solutions to bring more stability and solvency to the VOCA fund overall, or for Congress to utilize other funding if needed. 
Um, but we also will be looking to work closely with the state, with the administration and the legislature to make sure that regardless of what may happen at the federal level, that when California survivors of crime reach out for help, that help is available to them. Um, we know that any cuts to the Victims of Crime Act, which is far and away the largest funding source supporting crime victim services here in California, would be devastating, and that those cuts would not fall evenly across the state. They would be most heavily felt by communities that are traditionally marginalized and underserved. Um, they would be most heavily felt in our rural communities where lack of philanthropy dollars or other types of investments to support victim services um, mean the increased reliance on state-funded programs that rely on these Victims of Crime Act dollars. So this will be a big area of focus for us um, and an area that I hope we can work with this commission on as well. And while I'm thinking about and speaking about the traditionally marginalized groups and groups that are often facing barriers to receiving services, I do want to provide a bit of updates about some other overlooked groups um, that too often are not considered. But let me interrupt you before you launch into that, yeah. because I have a commissioner who has a question. Of course. Thank you. In the Great Recession in 2008, the state budget was $120 billion, and the legislature had to cut to $80 billion. I, I offer that as, as a predicate, because one of the things I think that our commission has um, tried in the past without success is advocating more money. Uh, the legislature is going to do what they're going to do based on conversations between the House and Senate and with the administration. Um, what we're more successful at, I think, is making sound policy choices. And what that means is there are many, many good ideas. Um, to be blunt, you gave us maybe 15 different bills. I can't remember a single number, and they all blur together. So what I'm really wondering is, what tree in the forest do you think we should go after first, and why? Great question. So I do, I do hear everything you're saying about the challenge of advocating for funding. Um, and we recognize that. Um, and the importance of policy change separate from funding cannot be understated. Um, that said, you know, the two are both critically important. Um, in terms of where to focus, I think that um, this commission has done a lot of important work in your initial reports around reducing barriers. And I think that's an important continued area. Um, as has been discussed by both of the prior witnesses, the need for a real whole of government approach um, is a really important example of where there could be really innovative solutions that come together, right? Be that a commission, be that a senior advisor, um, but a structure that allows for really whole of government approaches. And as I believe Eric referenced, the federal level, we've seen some examples of this. There was recently a national plan to end gender-based violence, which came out that addressed what a whole range of government agencies could be doing. Um, when it comes to funding, so in addition to simply the dollars, um, the obstacles to funding remain an issue and a barrier area. Um, the lack of stability of funding, um, but also the overall barriers that can exist around contracting with the state um, and contracting with any government agency. Um, the partnership works with a broad coalition led by Cal nonprofits on a range of issues around how the nonprofit sector as a whole, which includes domestic violence service providers, contracts with the state um, and how they are able to access funds. Um, and these are barriers that we especially feel for culturally specific and smaller grant programs who or smaller organizations um, for whom they don't necessarily have large startup funds, large development and grant management teams. And so I think those are certainly areas for this commission to 
um, continue to focus on and especially how the entire state can help bring a DV lens into the work that they do rather than the siloing of domestic violence as its own issue that lives independent and separate from our social safety net, our workplace policies, housing and homelessness or whatever other issue area we're discussing. Thank you. Commissioner Sidley. So I'm just gonna build on Commissioner Byer's points. Um, I think it would be incumbent upon your organization to work to make that hard choice and provide not just the commission, but also legislators. What's the priority? Is it housing? Is it contracting? Because I don't think this federal budget is gonna be your best friend when, when and if it ever comes to pass. I do think that there are some difficult times coming in for California. And so you and your organization, you're on the ground. You know much better than anyone else. So if the dollars shrink, where do they go? What what do they do? Now I heard some some tangible ideas of contracting barrier removal, but also I think that that a deep difficult look at prioritizing is is going to happen. So if you start now, I think that you'll be in a much stronger, better position. It's not a good message. I think it's a reality message, and I think that that's what Commissioner Byer was was getting to, because. Um, whatever comes out of the feds is not gonna be a pretty picture. So, um, and California is not in a position to be able to backfill whatever, all of that. I mean, whether or not there is money, it's not gonna be everything. So, um, but better that the message and the decisions come from people on the ground serving than somebody sitting in Sacramento who kind of knows a little bit about this, but not enough. And they think, oh, I know the answer that's not gonna get people the services that they desperately need. So I, I just to build on, I think where Commissioner uh, I, I, Byer was and make it a little bit more, a, a little stronger, you were nicer. Yeah, well, I don't know whether I'm nicer, but um, the California budget today is 330 billion. Exactly. So if you cut that by 10%, that's still less than the cut that occurred in 2008. So no one here is advocating anything on any budgetary point but we're kind of pointing to the reality. Um, the government shutdown will be a dose of reality for I think a lot of people and um, kind of in a triage mode. In, in that triage, what's most important and what's worthy of our attention? We found, I think over time, if we made 15 recommendations, mm -hmm. they get ignored. We make four, a lot better success rate. Mm -hmm. So. Anyway, that's the point. Commissioner Aaron. So I want to pre I appreciate your testimony. And I remember our discussions a couple of years ago, right? <clears throat> so I want to use a, a model out there um, because I think it could be helpful. Um, this year in the early childhood education community, we won $2 billion um, extra uh, new, new money coming in for the, two, for the following two years. Um, it took, we started developing a coalition um, prior to the 2008-9 recession. And we took the biggest, in that year, we took the biggest hit percentage-wise of any other sector in the state of California. We lost around one third of our budget at that point. And around 100,000 kids didn't get childcare because of that. <clears throat> and it dawned on the groups that were um, dealing with early childhood education that if we didn't start speaking with one voice, it was only gonna get worse. And so over the past 10, 12 years now, um, we now have a coalition of around 35 to 40 <clears throat> groups that participate in the coalition. Um, and it's all focused on the budget. And so what I was hearing from you, and I appreciate all the different issues that need to be need to be dealt with in the domestic violence, we have the same issue in early childhood education. Every group comes to the table with their particular perspective and what they need. Um, and we've become very um, um, 
disciplined, right, amongst this group about saying, we're going to decide on what the budget ask is, and everybody participates in that budget ask meeting that some people have to give up things. There have been years where the, the issue of paying providers appropriately has been the issue, which means that the parents themselves who need childcare have actually given up on the issue of spaces, of creating more spaces, because they realize the relationship between providers and, and kids, meaning that if you don't have providers, then you can have all the spaces you want, but you can't fill them. Um, and it's been it, it's been an incredibly successful um, operation. One of the other things I'd like to suggest, and I don't know how you approach the Legislative Women's Caucus, but if you've noticed, we use the Legislative Women's Caucus as our major um, um, fighter for us in the legislature, right? Um, and every year, their first topic is early early childhood education, right? Even above housing and above domestic violence and must admit that that's kind of, you know, maybe it's time to change, arrange something different there. Um, but you need, it's hard to find champions, individual champions in the legislature these days. But as a group, the Legislative Women's Caucus can be incredibly powerful, um, not only within the legislature itself, but with the governor. And so um, I, I think my recommendation is you've got to start moving away from having 30 bills, right? Um, it's, it's right, it, it doesn't, it, it doesn't it doesn't work right and so the and and people always have, you know the budget thing right the most most important policy bill that moves through the legislature is the budget right most people don't think about it that way i always joke and say no legislator runs for the leg, runs for the assembly or the senate based on they want to take on the budget they want to take on education they want to take on domestic violence they want whatever right it's all about the budget everybody let's be clear here um, and the other part of it that's so marvelous is, is that moving piece of legislation takes seven steps, moving a budget item takes two. Take your pick. You're either going to move it with two steps or you're going to take it with seven. Why not go the easy route and go and work on the budget, right? Um, and also the third thing is you need to think big. And I think you and I talked about that two or three years ago. If you're not going to ask for a billion dollars, then you're not going to get a hundred million, if, right? Right. Um, when I sat on budget committee, I used to ask for billions all the time, knowing that I would only get this much, but I'd get more than I had when I started. So why not Why not go big, right? It's time. I mean, um, we're going to be having this discussion two years from now, right, if we don't start thinking big about the issues of domestic and family violence as it impacts so many other places. Um, you know, we talked about this during welfare reform in the 90s, right? We had lots of discussions because because TANF is, is a resource for, for families of violence, right, that have been affected by violence. Where is that? Had, did it ever go anywhere, right? Because there were millions and millions of dollars available at that point for families directly. And so, but I think thinking big would be good here. And for listening to all of the testifiers so far, I know you're all interested in your own particular issues, but if you don't get a big, a, a big chunk of change, and as Mr. Mr. Byer pointed out, $320 billion budget, right? What do you mean there's no money there? There's money there, even with a 10% cut. We're talking about huge, right? It's a question of priorities. It's not a question that the money of, of the money. It's what your priority is this week. And it seems to me it's time for the domestic violence community to come together to start focusing on the budget and funding and, and not on every little specific little issue. Get some money on the table so that you can really do something. Absolutely. And the budget is definitely a top priority for us. You might be the only person I've heard describe the budget as the easy path in Sacramento, uh, but it is it is a key priority for us and something that, um, you know, as you mentioned, the early childhood education work and advocacy as a coalition, we have tremendous respect for. They've done amazing work um, and, you know, the, the need to bring a broad coalition together. As I mentioned, these funding cuts at the federal level don't just impact domestic violence. They impact all victims of crime. And then we are building a broad coalition to address it. But I appreciate the suggestions. From all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Looking at my commissioners, I see no further questions or comments. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before we close out this, if I may, before we close out this agenda item, we need to have a public comment session, although members of the public uh, may comment on any topic they wish during any public comment session. I will just mention that it would be most appropriate for members of the comment to public, uh, members of the public to comment now on intimate partner violence related issues. So you can certainly talk about anything you want, but um, uh, it would be really appropriate to discuss intimate partner violence at this time. We have one request to make comment from 
someone in the room, but it looks like you want to talk about labor trafficking, ma'am. Is that correct? Would you like to go now or do you want to wait until this afternoon? It's up to you. Okay. Okay. So we'll take up this. Any, uh, just to be formal here, any other requests in the room to make public comment? Seeing none, I'll ask Shara if anyone has raised hands to make public comment online. Hi there. Yes, we do have a couple hands raised. And before we go to them, Shara, I'll mention for members of the public that public comment is limited to three minutes per speaker, uh, and uh, commissioners will be able to hear you but not see you. So please adhere to the three-minute limit. Go ahead, Shara. Okay, thank you. Um, our first speaker that we're going to call on is Grace Glazer. Grace, you now have the ability to unmute yourself. Great. Thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? We can. Great. Excellent. Thank you. Good morning, all. My name is Grace Glazer. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the public affairs and policy manager at Valor, which is a national anti-sexual violence organization, as well as California Sexual Assault Coalition. I want to start by thanking the commission for convening us today and for this important conversation and to those who have already provided testimony. Um, additionally, thank you for releasing those reports in 2020 and 2021. Your reports urgently highlight the state's needs to adopt a holistic, strategic approach to preventing and ending gender-based violence and supporting survivors of domestic violence, sexual violence, human trafficking, and other types of interpersonal violence. In supporting the commission's call to prevent to invest in prevention resources. Um, as you heard, some of my colleagues, including Krista Colon and Beth Hassett and Eric Morrison-Smith mention, Valor worked alongside the California Partnership to End Domestic Violence, the Alliance for Boys and Men of Color, and the Culturally Responsive Domestic Violence Network in carrying multiple prevention budget asks over the year, urging the state legislature to invest in ongoing prevention funding. Um, in 2021, there was a 15 million one-time allocation that now supports incredible work that we are seeing roll out across the state for 46 programs that are doing anti-violence work. And most recently in 2023, we just saw SB 104 signed, which includes 2.3 million to extend the 2021 funding. This funding supports innovative on the ground work to prevent and end sexual and domestic violence. We know that prevention works and your reports point to this. And we recognize that prevention takes time and sustained funding. The lack of consistent funding continuously places programs in unstable positions, requiring them to frequently examine if they have the capacity to fund, continue their funding, to continue their important prevention work, and ultimately continue to influence anti-violence work across the state. We must explore avenues to pursue sustainable ongoing prevention funding and programming. In the same breath, while prevention continues to be deeply underfunded in California, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that there is a cliff coming to victim service providers and it will hit California hard. As Krista and Beth both mentioned, the anticipated shortfall to the Federal Victims of Crime Act, widely referred to as VOCA, will begin hitting California next year. California victim service providers are now weighing how they will absorb the impact of these cuts while continuing to provide essential support to survivors of crime. Um, we are anticipating an estimated $160 million shortfall, and we need the state to step in to support the significant gap in federal funding that supports survivors who are receiving these life-saving services. While VOCA funds are urgently needed, Prevention will ultimately help us reduce the dollar amount of crime victim service funding, and we need to be investing in sustainable, ongoing solutions. Thank you to the commission. Your three minutes has expired. If you can wrap up quickly, please. Yes. Thank you to the commission for your continued support. Thank you. Shara? Thank you. Our next person that will be called on is Richard Thomason. You now have the ability to unmute yourself. Great, thank you. I'm Richard Thomason, Policy Director for Blue Shield of California Foundation. Our mission is to make California the healthiest state and end domestic violence. Just wanna commend the commission again on a terrific report. And we very much appreciate your having this follow-up hearing. To Commissioner Byers' question, we think it's really critical for the state to create this stronger, more holistic leadership to address domestic violence and have some kind of central leader or commission to adopt and be accountable for the strategic approach that you've called for. That's a key recommendation, still badly needed, 
We urge the commission to focus on promoting that recommendation in your follow-up work. We also wanna very strongly agree with the previous testimony, highlighting the need for new permanent state funding dedicated to preventing domestic violence, which would enable the state and many, many local communities around California to build long lasting programs that are not threatened by funding instability. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Cher, I believe we have no other raised hands. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, so Mr. Chairman, at this time, we can close the public comment uh, section of the agenda. I don't know if the commission wants to take a brief break. We will convene a business meeting over lunch in the room behind us. That will still be in public session, of course, just so commissioners are aware. Members of the public are free to come and watch that meeting if you wish. It will not deal with uh, either intimate partner violence or labor trafficking, but with other commission-related business. So, um, but members of the public can come and watch, but we won't be talking about these issues. So I don't know, Mr. Chairman, if you want to take a five minute break before we yeah, turn let me, into the back room. Yeah, just let me suggest that commissioners, um, let's com let's commence the, uh, the business meeting at uh, 10 minutes to 12. Very good. Thank you. Thank you.
So, Mr. Chairman, we can now go ahead. Um, I believe Ashley's trying to do something quickly that she needs to do. That looks like a situation room picture. So we've all seen Okay. Oh, I know. Uh, she printed out. So. Oh. Okay, you may want to tell Ashley who did that. I don't know. Okay, so Mr. Chairman, we can go ahead and um, convene the all business right. meeting now. And uh, we are back on Zoom. There's both video and audio in this room, and the mics are live, just so everyone knows. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so this is uh, our business meeting for September 28, 2023. Let me take a look at what I have here. Right, Mr. German, may I just, uh, I, can, I can mention to you and save you the time of looking at the um, agenda. The first item is public comment. Thank you. We have to have during the business meeting. So if I okay. may, we'll move to that. Okay, so uh, moving into public comment, I see no request to make public comment in the room. Sure, has anyone raised hands online? No one has raised hands online. Okay, so Mr. Chairman, I think we can close the public comment session and move on to item two. Thank you very much. Right, item number two are the business meeting minutes from July 27, 2023. Um, do I have any um, questions, comments, or revisions to the minutes as presented? Seeing none, uh, is there a motion to adopt the minutes? So moved. There's a motion second. and multiple seconds in terms of anybody <laughs> keeping track of that. Uh, and so I'm you know, going to assume that that's sufficient. And the, minute, and the next minute will reflect when, when who made the motion and made the second. Uh, please call the roll. Uh, Mr. Chair. Aye. Mr. Vice Chair. Aye. Commissioner Ariner. Aye. Commissioner Byer. Aye. Assembly Member Chen. Commissioner Garcetti. Aye. Assembly member Hernandez, or Commissioner Hernandez, pardon me. I don't know if he is on or not. I believe he is not on. I don't see him on the he's list. On. Okay, he's not. Okay, uh, Commissioner Hernandez, Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Assembly member Ortega, Senator Min, Commissioner Sidley. Yep, aye. Senator Will, <laughs> uh, the motion passes. <laughs> All right, motion, yeah, motion passes, minutes are adopted. Next is item number three, implementation and impact report. So, Mr. Chairman, if I may, um, uh, this material uh, is in the packet, but I'll just run down briefly. Uh, item A is the summary of uh, supported legislation. Uh, this year, we took a support position on 10 bills that implemented our recommendations. Two of those have been uh, signed by the governor already. One is SB 544, the Bagley Keene reform bill. Uh, we'll talk about that in more detail when we get to our own meeting schedule. But uh, that bill was signed and also AB 479, which is related to the uh, intimate partner violence issue that extended a pilot program, uh, which gave six counties greater flexibility in providing batter intervention programs. Um, that pilot program would have ended and this was the, this bill extended it. So we took a support position on that. A third bill also related to batter intervention programs is on the governor's desk. Now, I actually meant to check this morning to see if he signed it today. But anyway, AB 304, that's on the governor's desk. Um, the other seven bills, unfortunately, did not advance out of the legislature. But of course, we it's a two-year session. So we'll see how many of those bills uh, continue on as we go forward. They're all still alive? Uh, uh, did they go to suspense and not come off? Uh, they, some of them went to suspense and did not come off, correct. And others are still alive. So, so it depends. Um, I can happy to answer any questions on supported legislation, although on the Bagley Keen Act, I think we'll come back to that on our own meeting schedule, but any other questions, happy to take. If not, I'll move on uh, with your permission to item B, which is the media coverage that is uh, just listed in your packet beginning on page eight, quite a variety of links there. And uh, so I think I'll let commissioners look at that. Item C, uh, 3C, is our legislative outreach. Um, and here I'm gonna ask Allie to talk about this a bit. In the wake of the legislative session, we wanted to use the interim as an opportunity to increase our legislative outreach, obviously during the interim, much more availability of staff, to be honest. Um, people or offices are beginning to look for bills for next year to be introduced in, in early next year. And so it's a good time to, to remind them about our work uh, and see what they're thinking about for bills for next year. So I asked Allie to undertake uh, an outreach project to offices and she's already started work on that. So Allie, do you want to talk about that? 
Sure. Um, so our legislative outreach project, we are aiming to contact as many legislative offices as possible. Our, um, one of our main goals is, of course, to just make sure that everyone is aware of the commission and understands what we do um, and also how we could be of use to them. So we want to make sure that they know, you know, we're a, or a nonpartisan office that uh, produces reports that they can use um, or refer to when developing their legislative agendas. Um, we want to make sure that they know how to contact us. And um, we, right now, we're prepping a presentation that we'll present to them um, in hopes that they'll work with us in the future. And we will also emphasize two legislative offices, and this is a bit of a tightrope perhaps, but that we are an independent commission. We set our own agenda. At the same time, we do seek input from the legislature and from stakeholders and everyone else. Um, and so we will take their input as to what they think we um, should work on, although ultimately it's for all of you to decide what we actually choose to do. Um, but in our experience, it is, it is beneficial to at least ask uh, I don't remember the legislature next to me last, but it is beneficial to at least ask um, what they think we should be working on. So that will also be part of our, our outreach to them. So a question that cuts across uh, legislative outreach, the media, implementation, legislation. And just ask the question of the chair, if it's okay. Uh, what lessons have we learned or have you learned over the last 10 years about what studies and reports have we been successful with in any of those dimensions? Enactment, the executive branch change, media attention, legislative engagement, and, and why? Yeah. Because at least I, I have some views on that that maybe yeah. worth discussing as we contemplate um, future report topics. Yeah. So, I'll, I'll tell a, a, a story that I think illustrates why we need to do this, and then I'll rely on staff to give us a sort of uh, temperature about what works. But years ago, um, when I first became chair, the uh, Little Hoover Commission staff was testifying in support of a bill, and I was in front of then member of Chesbrough, West Chesbrough, and there was some criticism, uh, opposition to the bill, and it was either the bill's author, or I think it was the bill's author, who said, well, you know, this is based on a recommendation from the Hoover Commission, thinking that that currency, right, had great weight. And uh, Chesbro, who was the chair of that particular committee, said, well, they're not known to be unbiased. Well, staff had a heart attack. Um, and when we had a meeting to discuss it, I said, well, who talked to the chair? And they said, well, nobody. And I said, no, you're wrong. Somebody did, it just wasn't us. And it was at that point that we decided that every time we had a report that the Little Hoover Commission in some capacity would go meet with the committees that had some impact with it. So that was some of our initial uh, outreach to make sure that we sort of set the frame for what our report meant so that it couldn't be misinterpreted and misused. Then it, it, as it relates to um, legislation, my gut tells me, and staff tells me if I'm wrong or not, a large part of our success is when we are savvy enough to take on issues that are in the current conversation so that it's less an academic evaluation of an issue, which is important, uh, but it becomes more more of a situation if you don't ever want to waste a, a, a good crisis. But staff can fill in with some of the other parts. Uh, I think that is true. I guess I would I would um, say that I think in general, um, in reference to your comment about outreach to the legislature, contacting committee staff, and so forth, I would say that um, all of the kind of outreach we do, whether it is media coverage, whether it is talking to legislative members, stakeholders, I was about to talk about general other outreach that we do, presenting at conferences and the like, all of that is really of a piece and it all works together. And 
helps to raise awareness both of our work and of the recommendations we've made and of the issues where we've issued recommendations. So I would say that we raising the profile of the commission generally is a, a good thing that has really helped us to get more attention. With regard to more specific um, topics, um, you asked Commissioner Byer where we've had implementation success. I would actually, although we heard this morning about the fact that certainly not all of the recommendations on intimate partner violence were implemented, we've actually had substantial uh, success on, on, I think we've had seven bills or eight bills that have been, that have passed, been signed into law, that implemented partially or totally recommendations in that report. Um, and so I think that's actually an issue where we've had some success. One example there, I think, is the first recommendation of the first, well, the only recommendation of the first IPV report, which was very specific and concrete. The state should issue the state portion of the grant upfront and not as a reimbursement. We, we were told by service providers that was a financial problem for them. We made a very concrete recommendation. There was a bill introduced, it was passed, it was enacted. It was enacted so. They got 35%. Um, and so I, I would cite that as an example where we made a very simple, concrete recommendation and had some success. Maybe we could hear from the former legislators this question, because you all served over a period of years, and maybe the perception of the commission changed, but maybe it's our efficacy has changed. Sort of what do you think worked and what hasn't? I, I would say. I worked with uh, the Little Hoover Commission on the dental insurance issue that is very focused, and I thought that was helpful to have, you know, kind of think take. As legislators, we don't have a lot of time to, or I didn't have a lot of time to dig into all these issues, and to have an organization that you that was respected and counted on, I think it helped. But I would also say, I mean, what the legislature is going to do, what the legislature is going to do, right? So I think it's important that we pick the topics that we think are important, and then try to go to the, to the legislature and see if they'll buy off on it. But and I think if you want to be success, successful, you, you kind of work with one out of the gate and help, you know, someone that shows an interest area in that. And, and then, you know, they each kind of do the bidding for, for us. So, my thoughts. Um, so, you know, I was a staffer for many years before I became a member of the legislature. And, um, I don't know if it was the commission didn't choose topics that I was involved in, okay, in human service, mostly in the human services world. And you also heard me talk about the state budget because I spent a lot of time dealing with the state budget because that's where it works. Um, and so um, I, I just I don't I can't I can't reply in, in regards to what it was like as a legislator. Okay, um, I can only I what I know is about the work that we're doing today, right? Um, and I think that. Um, I think that the make not only the makeup of the commission, I just think the staff work is so incredibly terrific that that makes a big difference. And so I can't speak to, I mean, I only knew one report of all those years I was here, which was the ones that was done on Fox Care by Peter, uh, what was Peter's last name? Um, um, not around to that one. Yeah, McGee, something like that. Yeah, something like that. I guess. Right. Yeah, anyway, yeah. right. That was the only. Thing. Thing. <laughs> Sorry, that's the only. People forget us. Oh, right. Um, this was the staffer, though. This wasn't anyway. Um, but I think top. I, I think top things that are topical, and you know, the front page of the newspaper tells you a lot about what's going on. Jackie Spear used to create her entire legislative package based on what was on the front page of Love's Poll. Much, right? She kept, I mean, it's always amazing, right? She kept folders of just articles, right? And then would decide. And I think it makes a big difference to the public and to the legislature. Um, and so, um, you know, I think that keep, that make that makes us relevant, right? Um, as long as, you know, as long as we're paying attention, that doesn't mean that we don't choose the topics, right? But I think the, I think being current um, is very important to the legislature to have an impact on that. Um, and I think it's been proven. I mean, I think we've, Playing out much more in the legislative um, arena than we did in the past, in regards to supporting bills and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and I think it makes a difference. Yeah. Well, we were we had some luck too. I mean, we did that the study on the Sierra and the health of the of the forest, forest and then it burned down. <laughs> so, so our study was well under the Yes. Um, so that was lucky. Um, I do think, I mean, just to build on Pedro's point, um, you know, never 
never let a good crisis go away um, or be ignored. So with that, I actually would recommend that we look at the insurance uh, situation in the state. I think that that is topical and we could actually make some real difference. I don't think many people understand the insurance business. Um, you know, they, everyone left. Now they're all coming back. Why? Because now they, they can raise the prices. So, um, you know, is it somebody that said to me, oh, insurance companies are really a bank. And so if you can't, if you can buy a T-bill that's going to pay you more than what your insurance your rates are, you're not going to play here. So, um, but I do think also it's going to be climate change. We're going to see where people can build. So I'm off topic a little bit, but I would recommend that for one of our next it's studies. It's an opportunity. All right. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, so the reason I'm raising this is in anticipation of the topic selection, but also to reflect on, I guess I've been to the second one. Yeah. Uh -huh. Nine years. Lots of tree rings. Um, and I pushed for things that I thought made sense, like occupational licensing. Mm -hmm. so, um, and it was she was bipartisan and ideological and it went nowhere. And because the legislature, as a former member who may not be <clears throat> free at the moment, uh, said to me, it was all about the money committees. The licensing committees got money from the occupations and they didn't want to change the licensing rules, even though it was something that would have helped poor people. Anyway, that may have been the wrong choice, even though it was the right topic. So, so sometimes we take a risk. And I think if we don't take risks, that's a mistake. Um, and sometimes being ahead of the game, the AI study we did in 2018 didn't seem relevant until you go back and read it. And you go, that was actually ahead of its time. Yes. And the governor's executive order actually implements some of those recommendations. And the salience of the staff work to do the outreach and the blog posts to remind people, hey, we did a study on this before, or to do implementation hearings like this. So I think we can make a success out of almost any topic, mm -hmm. um, but we do have to choose. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's no, 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 no. I'm not I might to... mention in line with that, Commissioner Byer, uh, uh, the government operations agency, which is largely responsible for implementing much of the governor's executive order, reached out to us the other day. In fact, through Stu Drone, you know, at my job uh, some years ago, uh, to say they'd like to meet with us to talk about the AI uh, oh. study. So um, that's an example where they are implementing change as required by the governor's order, and they want to talk to us. Yeah, they don't know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. <laughs> but I think that this our ability to um, have credibility to the chair's point, um, we're not in that situation with retail theft with a group of I don't know how many members of the legislature. Yes, it was like stunning. Yeah. And that meant we have credibility and they want somebody to pull no punches and ask lots of hard questions because they're looking for somebody to condense the choices, not <clears throat> take an ideological position. Yeah, I think part part yeah, I think part of what they were doing as well, having, having spent some time in the building as a member, is you're looking at a situation that is highly partisan. Right? You got a red divide, you got a blue divide. And they just keep clashing into each other. It's uncomfortable. It's not productive. You know, the public ultimately loses its patience. They just, and, and the brush that they use is very broad. It's like a pox on all your houses. I don't care that you can't get anything done. Somebody's at fault. I can't figure it out. You're all bad. So I think what happened, what's happened with retail is they turned around and said, right, let's give it to these guys. They're going to take the time to look at it. It gets it away from us because don't think for a minute they aren't telling each other, we, we can't deal with that right now. We got a little Hoover looking at it. And in fact, Reggie John Sawyer, when I saw an interview that he did on KTLA or some LA station, it's exactly what he said. He said, we've got the little Hoover Commission looking at retail. So that's a, another aspect of the role 
that we are playing that we hadn't played before. And I've been involved with the commission for many, many years. And <clears throat> this is a very different dynamic. The, the, the members are different. The approach uh, is different. Um, uh, I think in the past, I'm, I'm going back a long ways. Um, the work was almost so academic that it didn't plug into anything. It, there, there was no, 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 no hue and cry for like, what's the little Hoover Commission working on? And the commission would issue the reports, mail them to whoever they mailed them in the binders, and then move to the next topic without follow-up, without pursuing anything, without trying to build momentum behind the recommendations. They were just happy to have the hearings, issue the reports, and then move on to the next one. Well, this commission is not, is not like that. And I think part of why, and, I, and I'm going to say, a part of why we're successful is because of the personal characteristics of the members of the commission. And the investment that you all make on each and every one of these study subjects, the time that you take to read the material, pull the writing together, serve on the subcommittees, uh, spend time with the staff. You know, I've chaired a couple of the subcommittees and, and those conversations with staff, as, as, as you'll, you know, if you haven't done one yet, you'll find out um, they can be exhausting because you need to know what it is that they've looked at in order to have an intelligent conversation or you're just wasting their time. And if you waste their time, then what they bring back may not be what you ultimately decide you want to, you want to look at, which means they got to right plow that soil all over again. But I think everybody's commitment to what we're doing here is a, a significant part of why the product is as high quality as it is and why it's received the way it is uh, in the capital. There, what, what effort do you make, or do we make, to reach out to the leadership within the legislature by, I'm not just talking about the speaker, the committee chair, whatever, you got to go to the people that we need to get our ideas. And I don't know if we try and develop a particular relationship, or we just wait to see who responds, or who someone who already asks us to take a look at it, that I can understand. But no one has asses look at it or looking at it because it's important. What effort are we making to see is the leadership there with us? Uh, in terms of the legislature. Uh, yes. Yes. So um every every study we do, in fact, every blog post, everything we do goes to all members of legislature, right. goes to every chief of staff, every legislative mm -hmm. director in the legislature. We then do reach out specifically to offices. Sometimes that's in a fairly formal or structured way, like the kind of thing that Ali is going to be doing during the interim months here. That that work is most productive, we've found during the interim, during the session, the staff is just too busy. We also reach out through a variety of just independent personal uh, relationships. So for example, I, the, the, the chief of staff of the previous speaker was a good friend of mine, so I would keep her well informed about what we were doing. Uh, former Commissioner Emerson is now connecting me to the new, I do not know the new speaker's chief of staff, but He's connected, connected me to her, and I'm going to meet with her um, so that um, we try to sort of cement those relationships as well. Um, committee staff, committee chairs, um, try to reach out to them both formally and sort of informally, if you will. Um, and then the other thing that we've done, um, this was before you joined the commission, Commissioner Garcetti, but um, we have created those relationships sometimes in a very upfront way. So as an example, when we uh, held the first hearing on labor trafficking, Mar put this hearing together in San Diego, um, we held that hearing in San Diego in the pro Tems district and she came and opened the hearing and actually attended half of the hearing um, because this was an issue that was of importance to her. She has a border district, et cetera. We, the organics report grew out of a conversation in the very initial stages with the speaker's staff who said he was interested in some issue related to recycling organics, something. He, they didn't really care what it was, but something like that. So that was why we then held the first hearing on organics here right. in this facility, and he opened that hearing. 
So we um, actually, um, if you go all the way back to the first hearing on IPV, Senator Rubio testified who has been very open about her own experiences as a survivor of domestic violence. So we can also create those relationships kind of at the front end and then build onto those at the back end. And, and still to this day, we keep, for instance, in the, in the case of the pro tem, I know Tamar keeps Mariva Brown, who is her um, person on social service issues or human service issues, keeps her quite abreast of what we're doing on all of these issues, including this hearing for instance. So I think we that's a that's a sort of iterative process in which we um, build those relationships over time. But I think we're doing that. I hope yeah, I'm yeah. sure we can do more of it, and that's why Ali's going to be doing more of it. Okay, that, that's great, and, and certainly the staff they have a great staff. They can do that if you ever need one of us. I'm sure that we'd be there to assist in any way. That's it. Yeah, that's it. Yes, we, we, we will and we have. And that actually leads a bit to uh, the next the, the next topic, which if I may, Mr. Chairman, I'll just go to other outreach activities um, because some of these are by commissioners. So this is a good, it, it's a nice segue. There's a list on page nine, but I'll just sort of hit the high points. Mr. Chairman, as you know, you will be doing a lunch webinar for the Maddie Institute next month or perhaps in early November, I can't recall, uh, and taping the Maddie Report Program. You are also going to attend the 50th anniversary of the Latino Legislative Caucus as a former member of the caucus. Commissioner Beyer recently did a podcast with Tom Daschle, the former U.S. Senate Majority Leader, on the AI on AI issues, um, and we cited that that podcast then in our blog post. Again, kind of one thing building on another. Commissioner Sidley's going, and I apologize, this is not in the list on page nine. That's my error, my omission. Commissioner Sidley is going to be speaking at the Continuing Legal Education Conference on CEQA toward the end of this year. I believe that is in uh, December. Um, I'll be speaking to the County Grand Jury Association in October. Um, Crystal recently presented at two conferences on the organics report. We recently met with the California Research Bureau. So all of these things I think build on each other in the way that Sacramento is a, kind of a small town and there's a lot of interlocking relationships there, so. Yeah, just let me make a correction. Where it says future outreach, it says Chair uh, Peter Nava will speak at the Latino caucus. I'm, I'm not a speaker. I'm just attending. Our, our so that was, that, was, that, that was just a that was just an oversight. It's an oversight on their part. Well, I don't want them calling me and saying, "Hey, who invited you?" <laughs> um. Uh. With that, uh, happy to answer any other questions. If there are not, Mr. Chairman, if I may, I'll move to yep. item four, which is the project and meeting schedule. And here, I really want to. I'll, uh, well, uh, we'll deal with item A first, and then we'll go on to B, which is probably a longer conversation. But item A is the update on current studies. Um, work continues at the staff and subcommittee level on CEQA, on the aging and on, on the aging study, and on the retail theft study. In fact, we have a subcommittee meeting tomorrow morning on retail theft, for instance. So those um, either drafting the reports, recommendations on CEQA and aging is underway, planning for the hearings is underway with regard to retail theft. I do think, um, Mr. Chairman, this might be a good uh, time since we're talking about current studies to discuss how the commission wishes to follow up on today's hearing to oh, urge yeah. additional implementation. Um, my own suggestion would be that we do need to do some document. Um, Marna talked a little bit about what, what we might do, but some document that goes to the governor and legislative leadership or someone to, to urge additional implementation. But I wanted to sort of yeah. open up a discussion of what the commission would like to see us do. Now. Well, I think Commissioner Garcetti articulated uh, uh, that and in terms of the need <clears throat> for a specific action by the commission. Um, because once again, as, as we've learned, right, people behave differently when there are witnesses. Um, and it's what we're hearing today, I think, is, is, is important in that you would think that the creation of, um, you know, the Commission on Aging, the Commission on Domestic Violence, uh, whatever it is you want to call it, uh, would seem to be a relatively simple thing to put together. And since, in all likelihood, what you, they're not meeting weekly, they're probably not even going to meet monthly, they might meet quarterly, um, and most of the people who participate in all likelihood will already be members of organizations receiving a salary. So they're not gonna have to pay them a hundred bucks per meeting. Um, 
So there's the cost of travel associated with it and some staff support for how often it meets. But it sends, a, a I think, a powerful signal about how important coordination uh, is. And the example that the witness gave about the electronic license plate, and guess what? Your batterer or I can dial you up and figure out, oh, well, there's my kids. And then guess what? These places where you have safety, they're not safe anymore. So we, I mean, <clears throat> I think it's, a, 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 I'm, I'm certainly open to ideas from commissioners on what they think is the best vehicle to get that out. It could be a blog post. It could be, you know, an uh, update, right, from Little Hoover Commission on our, our earlier reports based on witness testimony. And, and in it, you could praise the work that has been done, but bemoan what hasn't been done and what could be done. And I think part of what would be um, uh, helpful is those things that aren't going to take a whole lot of money, particularly since everybody's work, thinking about the budget. Do you ever meet with the editorial staff of the major newspapers? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, we do as well. Yeah, we do. We, we, we um, send things out to press. We do op-eds fairly often. We haven't done it. We, we just had one where we had less luck placing it. But we traditionally, whenever a study is um, released, we do an op-ed by the subcommittee members on that topic. Um, yes. Um, but, but my specific question is, do you meet with the editorial staff? Well, we haven't met with the editorial boards. Uh, oh, yes, if you mean yes. if you mean the editorial board, for instance, yes. of, of exactly. yeah, the, right. Um, we have not, um, at least in my time here, we've not actually requested a meeting with the, the editorial boards. Um, we could do that. Um, There's no downside to doing it, and no. I think there's an opportunity there to educate them, because most people. I mean, I don't know how many of you. So I'm a member of the, of the Little Hoover Commission. What? Now, they don't know what it is and what we have, the responsibility we have. And when you start telling them, well, that's pretty heavy stuff that you're dealing with. Then, yeah. So, especially, especially if I'm telling people for this recently, they've, they've heard about me joining. <clears throat> the fact that it's an independent, nonpartisan. Yes, yeah, that, that is key. We need to talk about that. That is, that is really key. And that's why it, it's really important to me right now because of the chasm that we have between the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, if the editorial boards pick up on the fact that, okay, this is really nonpartisan, no one knows about it, this is what they do, and look at the important things that they have done, they can, we can give them one or two, three examples of it. I would encourage us to attempt meetings with the editorial board. I mean, if they ignore you, okay, so be it. What do you think nonpartisan are like, honestly, because you can't have more than seven of one party, so I'm just curious. Well, I'm, I'm not partisan. Most, many of the majority of the members, well, not the majority, but the largest number of members are nonpartisan now. Isn't that interesting? Nonpartisan is your, they're not, your, they're not registered. Decline the state. Decline the state. state. Okay. Yeah. Or it's really right. MPP, as it is now called right. in California. Okay. Yeah. 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 But so the commission is, is not necessarily. You are, but the commission itself is. It has you can't have more than one particular group, no matter what it right. is. Right. So is it bipartisan? I'm just I sorry, I'll yeah. I'll let it go. I'm just it curious. Is, it is in fact, I mean it I think either word could be used. It is yeah. nonpartisan, it is also bipartisan in that there are members of the commission who are both registered Democrats and registered Republicans. And you can't have more than seven of any particular exactly. um well, what about nonpartisan non nonpartisan then? I mean our are, are suggestions for policy are nonpartisan. Our suggestions for policy are generally, um, I mean, there's, there's no partisan there, elements in anything the I've read so yeah. far. There's nothing right. partisan I see in the writing. Co correct. We don't say, you know, this is the Democratic Party suggesting or the Republican Party suggesting. This is the just two parties or three based or four or on our parties. studies, you know, this is what this group is suggesting. Right. I, I mean, but just, I was just curious. I've always described this as bipartisan, not nonpartisan, because I'm partisan. But there's others, I mean, Bill Emerson, you know, Anthony, you guys, you know, they have a position, not strong one way or another. I don't think of myself as, but I, 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 it's a stupid point. I was just Can I go back to, to the chair's question about what should we do? I think, well, I, I think, <laughs> sorry. I think, just, I think in terms of, 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 of 
of the commission, bipartisan, whatever we call ourselves, back in the day, there, you didn't have decline to states. Right. Everybody was one or the other. So that's why it would be called bipartisan. But I do think moving as we move forward, the nonpartisan is probably more accurate. But and better for our marketing. Yeah, I know I agree with you. So I do think in terms of you know, what do we think is the most effective way to get uh, the results of this meeting out to the folks who make a difference. So uh, this applies to both topics for today. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's sort of with the theme. Um, I have a theory and there's some psychological research that no one can remember more than three things. Um, occasionally, like 10% of people can remember four things. But you know, if you're going to buy a car, say you bought. Yeah, so, so if you're going to buy a car after the cup holder, you know, it's the engine size or whether it's a station. That's about it. You can't really remember very many things. So a letter is better than a report, which is, I think, slightly better than a blog post. So you go blog post is the minimum, and then the letter, and a letter that recommends concrete. Um, steps that can be taken not by the legislature by the executive by the executive yeah. because i think what we heard today is the advocacy groups are perfectly capable of getting legislation introduced and having hearings and good luck with that and exactly. i think commissioner erner pointed out the potential flaw in that approach but most of what we heard today is around either resources and we're not well situated to make resource allocation decisions. But a lot of it is collect data, use the data, and coordinate. And so the best success I can recall was the um, focus you had, Mr. Chairman, on dental. I mean, the second letter, and I think there was a third letter, got increasingly more pointed. And well, she's not a moron. Well, she's not in state government anymore. I know. Right. It's uh, um, but it was the kind of monomaniacal focus on fixing <laughs> a particular problem. Oh, well, yeah, right. And well, so, in, in the case of intimate partner right. violence, right. we kind of have to choose which one two. or two. Know. Yeah, one or two. Personally, I wouldn't do contracting because I don't think that's a broad enough thing. And it also seems to serve the interest of groups as opposed to right. people who are in the community experiencing the problem. I agree. I think it should be the coordination issue. Yeah. And and maybe the, it could be, the letter could be drafted by the subcommittee chair and vice chair from the earlier reports. They're, they're, they're in. They're here. Oh, all right. Well, in each case, one uh, on the two topics today, one of the subcommittee members is still uh, here. Uh, Commissioner Sidley was on the subcommittee on uh, IPV, and Commissioner okay. Aaron was on the subcommittee on traffic. Okay. The other members of the subcommittee that left. Well, then, so, no, if, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I interrupted you. No. No, no. I was just going to say, if I could, if I could summarize just a process question here, uh, we could follow up with uh, staff would work on. A follow-up document, a letter, perhaps formatted so it looks a little nicer or something, have some impact. But a staff would work with the subcommittee members on a follow-up document, uh, focusing whenever possible on executive actions. Yeah. Uh, um, I, we could also reiterate the need for legislative actions as as required. But focusing on executive actions, we would then. Uh, seek approval from the subcommittee members and the chair uh, so as to speed things along. These are not new recommendations, so we won't come back to the full commission, and we would release that. And I would suggest, actually, that we do. When we release that, we would release the letter, the document, whatever it is, and do a blog post and do an op-ed. So I would suggest trying to do all three of those. Yeah. But I think, you know, and I, and I think look, the point of the letter is it'll be relatively brief. It doesn't have to be long. And and if it's if it's focused, that's you get people to pay attention to it. And just for Commissioner Garcetti, the issue on the dental was that we whoever that person was that was in charge of the program, just I do remember her name. No, no, I, you know, I, we don't we don't need the name, but <laughs> but during one of the meetings, 
and talking about the challenge, right, of outreach and recruitment, this person said, you know, they're not like us. The, the bennies. They're not like us. And so that was that was I was so worked up about it. That was the first time that the commission sent out a letter that had an audio link that included that we took what she said as part of the audio link in the letter. So that when you got it electronically, you click on the link and hear that person's words. What happened to her? She left. She left state government. She on her own. Maybe maybe we shouldn't get into this. Okay. <laughs> she is pursuing other ventures. Spending right. more time with her family. Spending more time. With family. Yeah. And yes, yeah, she did work for us, and that's all we have to comment. Right. That's right. right. Okay. So is that, Mr. Chairman? Should I? Um, uh, we, we we will we will draft a letter in conjunction with the subcommittee members and the chair and release that letter. And we will at that time decide if we also do other sort of promotional activities such as the blog right. post or op-ed in conjunction with that letter. Yeah, because part of what to think about is like the non, when you do a blog, the nonprofits take that and they forward that to their members. Right. Yeah. So it comes in a format that's attractive, it gets their attention and shows up nice on the screen. If, if I get one amendment. Yes. I wouldn't personally spend the time on an op-ed until we get some traction about the recommendation. Okay. And then it, it it becomes a live thing. Then either an op-ed or Commissioner Garcetti's idea of visiting an editorial board, doing um, a full frontal attack on every report and every issue is a big burden on the staff, and we should maybe temper our enthusiasm. Okay, so we will um, we will pursue that strategy then. If that's I think yeah, that would okay. be like Taylor Swift going to every football game. Oh. Um, First, it's movies. Yeah. Now it's sports. <laughs> yeah, I'm a football well, fan. Uh, with, going to the Beyonce. <laughs> and with regard to uh, uh, additional, uh, there was some discussion of of potential future topics such as insurance. I'll just mention very briefly. We uh, we certainly. Took those down, but while we are, we're going to update you later on hiring the new project manager. While we are short one project manager, we do not have bandwidth to add any additional topics right now, just so that the commission is clear. Okay, if I can move to 4B, which is the future meeting schedule, and here I would refer commissioners to material on page 11 if you have your packets, but if not, that's fine. Um, in effect, the, the Bagley Keene reform signed by the governor, in effect, uh, gives us the ability to meet either in person or uh, remotely, and if you are participating remotely, you do not have to disclose your location, nor does that location have to be publicly accessible. So you can now uh, participate from from your home without disclosing your home address or making it publicly accessible. Um, we can now plan ahead in a way that we haven't been able to do for the last couple of years. The commissioners who've been here a while know that we had executive order after executive order, followed by bill after bill, and then another executive order and so forth, changing and extending Bagley Keene waivers and so forth for the last two years. We now have some stability, so we can actually plan out a meeting schedule for the next year. Last December, we polled the commissioners and as commissioners expressed a preference for a hybrid meeting schedule with quarterly in-person meetings, and we set approximately 10 Zoom meetings. The in-person meetings would be day long, the 10 Zoom meetings and more or less, would be two to three hour, the kind of Zoom meetings we've held during the pandemic. So the what would be helpful for us to know now from a commission discussion standpoint is, is that still the will of the commission to plan that out? And if it is, we would then implement that schedule for the coming year of quarterly in-person meetings and, and about 10 Zoom meetings a year. So we still be able to, on the quarterlies if we need to, just yes, you can still you can still participate um, remotely uh, during the quarterly meetings. Um, we another option would be that we would have ten in person meetings a year, and people could participate remotely if they wish. But I would I actually think that would give us the worst of both worlds because what would happen is we'd probably have three or four commissioners present physically, everybody else participating remotely, and so we'd have the costs of the in person meeting, but not the advantages of bringing you all together. Okay. <laughs> so yes, you could still participate remotely on the quarterly. But 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 I will say that if we uh, th there are there are expenses to the in person meetings that we don't right. face for the Zoom meetings. So if we're going to do four quarterly in person meetings, 
the hope would be, I think, that whatever degree possible, I know you all have busy schedules, but to whatever degree possible, commissioners would be present for the for the four designated in-person meetings. Does the vice chair have an obligation to be at? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the vice chair's prerogative. So what we're talking about is four in-person and 10 Zoom. So that's 14 meetings a year. Approximately. Okay, yeah. all right. Because we, we are, I think in our regular rules, it was that you'd have 10. So pre-pandemic, the commission met 10 times a year in person, obviously, no, no remote participation. There was no... Um, during the pandemic, when we were meeting entirely by Zoom, we increased that and we met 21 times yeah. one year and I think 22 another time. Yeah. Um, so we amped up our metabolism quite a bit. Uh, what I'm suggesting here is some, uh, yeah. some, some in-between measure. If we tried to do four quarterly in-person meetings plus 18 Zoom meetings, I think we test the bandwidth of the staff. Well, that's too much. So yeah. What is yeah. the length of the Zoom meetings? They're usually two to three hours. We try, we aim for two, but sometimes they'll, we almost never pass three. Right. Right. Can I just yes. a small caveat? I, I like the hybrid approach. Um, I'd like to consider on the four quarterly that we think about not just Sacramento. I think yes. it's very good for all of us and f to not just be sitting in Sacramento. So. Yeah, yeah. Ethan yeah, and I uh, talked about that earlier this week, but I, I do think there's, a benefit to both the commission as well as the community where we're meeting to, to have those meetings in I mean I recognize nobody's in location. Nobody's right? really here, but I still think it's I really like <laughs> <laughs> you're not gonna be there anyway. So when you care. <laughs> so a consideration is in the home <clears throat> district of relevant members of the legislature because I think that's Served us really well in the past. Sure. Um, I wonder if it would serve us also if we, I mean, it's it's very hard for members of the legislature, current members of the legislature who are only you know, are sitting here um, to get to these meetings because they're, sure. if they're on Thursday, if they're not in Thursday afternoon, they're still in session on, we've talked about this before, right? Um, but it would it help them, right, if we ever thought about having one or two in their districts? Well, and I have no idea. I mean, I think. Well, you know, what we did with uh, Rendon and what we did with the Senate Pro Tem, yeah, um, was we worked around their schedule so that they could be there. Um, and I don't remember what day of the week it was. Um, and, uh, you know, for example, if we were to, if Revis would um, like to have a meeting in his district, and so that's Hollister. Uh, McGuire is, you know, North, North Coast. Um, and I think that's a really good way to, build that relationship with both of, of the leaders and we can be flexible, right? Depending on what the, the schedule provides. So I think it's open, but I do think just in general, the notion of uh, quarterly meetings in person, location to be determined, uh, and then with uh, a Zoom meeting, remote meetings on the others seems to be an acceptable way for the commission. And, okay. uh... The preference is, say, for one or two meetings a year in Sacramento, of the four quarterly in-person meetings, one or two in Sacramento and two or three, two and a half around the state. Is that a fair? I'm just picking up. I would say the two or three in Sacramento. Okay. 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 Um, uh, the other, let me just ask, actually, one of the questions, which I hadn't thought to ask, but um, we during the pandemic, we used to begin the Zoom meetings when we held them at 10 a.m. We then switched to noon. Um, do people have a preference for when we start? The, I'm speaking here only of the Zoom only meeting, so the last approximately two, two and a half hours, something like that. Is for there me, a for me a preference is the afternoon, but that's just because, yeah. Yeah. Just because the overall hours are in the morning. <laughs> yeah, you know, I don't you know, it depends on the commissioners. And because if you've got a a, <clears throat> a two hour meeting that, that possibly goes to three and you start at 10 you've almost chewed up the day because you're not going to do much of anything before 10. And if you go until one o'clock, then maybe you fill up your afternoon with appointments as compared to if you know you've got from eight in the morning until noon, that's clear, then from 12 to two or three. But my schedule is, is extremely flexible. I don't know what other people's is. So I think as long as we know ahead of time, we work no. around it. So. 
Uh, well, this know. is really for the committee. It doesn't, uh, for the staff, to be quite honest, it doesn't matter. We're there anyway. So it doesn't matter. Yeah, but, but I think yeah, but, given, given the flexibility of Zoom to have out of town expert right. witnesses, which we've got using Zoom, um, we are delegating to the staff to okay. figure that stuff out. If okay. it makes a difference to somebody who's in New York or some other place, we should accommodate that as long as we have two or three weeks. Yeah, notice. as long as we have notice, we can usually. Okay. I think that's just okay. 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 Um, thank you for that. That's very helpful. So we will be sending you an updated meeting schedule for the next year, and I don't anticipate that will change given the Bagley Keen situation now. I should mention, by the way, all of the Bagley Keen changes, um, the, the 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 main reform bill sunsets January 1st of 2026. So we have a two-year, roughly two-year sort of experiment, if you will, with these new provisions, and then absent more legislative action, we'd go back to the old system. So we'll see. Um, if I can move on to item five, Mr. Chairman, um, for the sake of time, I'm gonna skip <clears throat> item A, if I may, and go to B, which is the update. And I'm gonna go these, through these quickly because we'd like to restart at one o'clock, I think. Uh, update on the hiring of the project manager um, uh, after uh, the Kafka-esque nightmare that they were dealing with the Department of General Services process. We now have that job posted. We're accepting applications. We're starting to promote that position. Um, we are probably going to have to, and I haven't actually mentioned this to Cheryl, but I think we're going to have to extend the filing deadline. But we, uh, my goal is to perhaps have a new project manager in place by the start of the calendar year, January 1st. I don't think, given the state's process of hiring, uh, which is Byzantine, we can do it any faster than that. So, um, Would you send a copy? Yes, we will be sending you a copy and we would encourage you all to send it out as widely as you can to your own networks to encourage anyone who wishes to apply. And we're doing a study in January on that particular day. <laughs> <laughs> um, revising the commission's rules of procedure. Um, uh, the, commi the, the rules of procedure are badly in need of an update on a whole bunch of different levels. There's overtly sexist language. There are things that have that are called for that would be illegal under the Public Records Act. Um, there's technological uh, requirements that make no sense anymore and so forth. So I would suggest if it meets with the commission's approval that we would, the staff would uh, produce a revised set of rules of procedure uh, in consultation, I think with the chair and the vice chair, and then come back to the full commission at some future meeting for discussion and potential approval. But I just wanted to highlight for people, unless someone has an objection, we'll work on revising those. They obviously can't, you, you all have to approve them. So we'll have to come back to the full commission, but. Good. Good. Um, and uh, then. I would also make one, I guess adjacent uh, suggestion. And that is the presentation that we hear. Uh, I talked to uh, one of our speakers today. He was a good speaker, but he read his whole thing. You lose your audience. Yes. When five, you read, five seconds. Uh, and I told them the best thing that you could do is what Mr. Breyer did. You, he took the the key parts of what he was saying. Give us those. Give us those. You have to assume we have read that carefully. Otherwise, it's a it's a waste of time for me, for us, and for him to do this. And I said, no one's ever told me that. And I said, well, I'm suggesting I've testified a lot and I've given a lot of talks. <clears throat> And if someone's reading the speech and not making any eye contact after a while, your mind is wandering and you're you're not with them. Could we produce a small document with some method guidelines for presenting? We do. We we ask witnesses not to read their testimony and to hit the high points during their oral presentation, and we will try to emphasize that more in the future. But we do ask them that. Um, I would say, please do not read. Your I think there's a video. If, if you look at. It was staff for 10 years, so I did hundreds of hearings. Mm -hmm. The House changed their rules and says, you only have a limited period of time. You cannot read your statement. The chair says, if somebody starts reading, I'm sorry, we asked you not to read. The more you read, the shorter your period of testimony is going to be. In other words, a very enabling the chair. And I think we could change our procedures to make that a rule. And that way, you you can send to the witnesses in advance. 
We expect you to be succinct. You have five minutes. Do not read your testimony. If you start reading, you'll be cut off. So it can be said more politely, but I think I can certainly do that if the chair wishes to. Well, I, look, I'll just I'll just tell you based on the experience that we've had with uh, with some witnesses that one of the things that I've always uh, emphasized with staff and my questions of, of Ethan and staff is how much time did you tell them they had? And mm -hmm. and I'll often get an agenda with like eight minutes, seven minutes, whatever the length of time is. Yeah, having having said that, you're going to have some witnesses who are so nervous that they are giving testimony before a body that they consider to be of significance. Yeah. And they don't trust themselves to sort of speak off the cuff. And some of them, you don't want them to speak off the cuff. So there's a mix, there's a mix here between, so for example, the first witness, and I, I, did, I did not say this, but I, I thought it, your presentation today was so much better than the first one. Because by now she was experienced. Mm -hmm. She knew us. She was comfortable with us. She was kind of casual. She made a remark. She was engaging. But that, that was a different witness from the first time. First time was kind of rigid and apprehensive. And I think when you have people who are not professional folks who give testimony, reading the statement provides them a shield. But I, I, I know what you're saying. Okay. Now, what used to happen with with some frequency is we would have a witness start to read this statement and then buyer would go let me ask you something right, right? i got a question for you and so that was that was the genesis of what you've heard me say to the witnesses although i didn't this time which is please bear in mind if i interrupt you it's a compliment because that means the commissioners are interested in what it is you have to say they've read your statement and they have some questions so I would say we could do a combination of the two. We could emphasize, staff could emphasize with the witness, please understand that uh, this these commissioners have read your material. They are familiar with it. They've annotated their copies. They have questions for you. Um, and if you want to provide a summary, it's going to then give the commissioners the opportunity to have a real conversation with you. And then I would also tell my commissioners, uh, if you want to, then just put your hand up and interrupt as they're in the middle of their uh, of their presentation, and we can roll it that way. I think when you're putting this together, what you're going to give dinners, I would emphasize that you will be much more effective if you do it in this fashion as opposed to reading. I mean, they're there for a reason, and you know they've spent a lot of time preparing. Their, some of them, you're right, are going to be very nervous. Maybe most. Of them are going to be somewhat nervous, and, and that is a shield to be able to read it. But in terms of what they're trying to accomplish, they're not going to accomplish as much if they do it in that fashion as opposed to. Yeah, let us know how, what the key points are. But I will tell you, I do know the staff tells tells them that they tell them that as they go through their prep with the witness about the you know the, the agenda. What are you going to talk about? What's your material? Blah blah blah, and then they staff tells them. This is how it's going to operate, you know. But there are some occasions, particularly when you have witnesses who are, are, you know, the inventors of the atom bomb, that you're not likely to swoop in and say, "Oh, and by the way, did you forget what I told you? I told you you got three minutes, pal." Yeah. Right? I don't know if Ethan told you, but I, I read all of the um, I transcribed all of the, uh, the testimonies from the July twenty seventh hearing and ran them through a generative AI. Filter to give me a quick summary of bullet points of all the testimonies. No kidding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I'd like to be able to do that. Uh, How cool. <laughs> Mr. Chair, <laughs> for our, yeah, tomorrow. I think also for our participants who are non English speakers yeah, or in case of survivors. Um, and the real, when you ask real people to testify, what I call real people, yeah. the people who are consuming the services or are being affected by it, it's a whole other issue than the, you know, for them. Yeah. yeah. Well, we, I think we, we will return with revised rules and procedure, yeah, and we'll try to. But emphasize. the meeting today was unusual. I mean, we usually don't let. We usually ask questions. These people, right. all of them, went much longer because they were reporting on sort of what yeah, happened in the past. And I think we, it, it we just we was have a, asked them to give right, but it was a completely different type of of experience for us. Usually, 
to quote the chairman, David does jump in right. with the questions usually much more quickly. It's a compliment. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. Uh, 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 so, Mr. Chairman, I believe we do have the witnesses for the afternoon outside. So let me just very briefly ask, we are also one of the projects I just wanted to update people on is we are updating the website, which in my view sorely needs an update. And Ali can briefly talk to you about that because she's in charge of that. Uh, yes. So we are just a few months away from launching a whole brand new website redesign. Um, we are focusing on functionality. The website that we have is pretty clunky. Um, it's hard to navigate to find what you're looking for or even know what's available to look for. So um, it's going to be you know, much more sleek design. Um, and I believe the first week of December, we'll have a soft launch which will be, you know, fully functional. Um, we just won't, you know, promote it yet to work sure that all the kinks are worked out. So that'll be by the end of the year. Right. And one of the keys to the website is that right now, uh, if you go to our homepage, if we do not control what shows up on the homepage, it's randomly generated. Oh, okay. And so any study can come up at the top, any hearing can come up at the top. So uh, to me, that's uh, not functional. And we will now control what is on the homepage. And so when people go to the homepage, and I'm thinking here particularly of led, talking about uh, media people, uh, uh, legislative staff, it's, it's stakeholders, et cetera, we will be able to produce content that highlights whatever it is we think the commission is doing that is most important. So that is the okay. principal functional change, but I think it is an important. So Unicorns and dolphins. Yeah. yeah, can I just offer a suggestion? So we're having a hearing this afternoon. I know that topic of our report. So I put it in, and then you get a very static thing, press release, summary, full report. It gives you no context of whether anything happened after the report. It, does, it It's impossible to read it quickly. You could conceivably use AI to summarize both the report and what's happened since the report was issued and put that on a website and, and make it more functional. It's just as a thought. No, I think I, I, I uh, those are great suggestions and we will do that. I don't know that we need AI to do that. Allie can do it. But anyway, she's our, our AI. But um, uh, I completely agree with what you're saying. And, and trust me, having seen the, the, the um, wireframes, I think they're called of the website from the design company, it will look and function very, very differently and be much better and much more because we, we recommended to the executive branch that they not create 1,200 accounting jobs by specific title. And so if you search under Little Hoover report, you shouldn't have to get the name of the report perfect in order to have it full of and stuff like that. Yeah. So Jason, how long did it take you to put the data in and get back your, your talking points? Oh, there's, there's a service that does this. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, but even that, did you did you get it back in a day? Yeah, you, I got it back next day. Uh, I'll share it with you if you'd like to see it. Yeah, yeah I would. I, I totally. Like, <laughs> that's very interesting. All right. Yeah. Uh, business, no further business. This is many. I know. <laughs> okay.
afternoon, everyone. Let me apologize. It's about eight minutes after one o'clock. We were scheduled to start at, at one, um, but I had some administrative things I had to take care of. But we are now ready to begin the afternoon session of our Thursday, September 28th, 2023, meeting of the Little Hoover Commission. Uh, this section of uh, our meeting today has to do specifically with the state's response to uh, labor trafficking. And um, if actually, if you would be so kind to introduce our first witness and welcome everyone. Thank you, Chair Nava. Our first set of witnesses this afternoon, we have Ryan Jorbin, who is the deputy in charge of the Labor Justice Unit and Economic Justice in Ontario Fraud Unit within the Consumer Protection Division of the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office. She also co-chairs their Labor Trafficking Subcommittee of the Los Angeles Regional Human Trafficking Task Force. She will be joined by Joseph Mellis, who is the Deputy County Counsel for the Los Angeles County Council and has been uh, with the office for over five years. He also chairs the Labor Trafficking Subcommittee of the Los Angeles Regional Human Trafficking Task Force. You take a seat at the table and when you're, thank you again for joining us this afternoon. When you're ready, please begin your testimony. Good afternoon. Thank you for uh, inviting myself and my co-chair, Joe Mellis, to um, speak to you today. Uh, we appreciate this opportunity to talk about um, the things that we have seen with these reports and ways we feel that these reports can be utilized to improve labor exploitation, uh, work against labor exploitation here in the state of California. Um, I use the term labor exploitation on purpose. Labor trafficking is very the, the very tip, the very most extreme of the ways that people are exploited uh, for their labor and for their work. But labor exploitation covers everything from wage theft to trafficking, and I think is a more descriptive term of what we need to do here in the state of California and indeed across the United States to make sure that this uh, financial and personal crime against humans is um, nothing's ever eradicated, but mitigated. Um, labor exploitation is a spectrum of behavior. In 2014, a report um, authored by Colleen Owens uh, and others um, talked about how labor exploitation works. And she explained a spectrum and basically that spectrum started from being paid less than you were promised all the way to threats or use of violence. And of people at the lowest wage, so minimum wage workers, 80%, over 80% were not paid what they were promised. We're not paid the minimum wage. And from that spectrum, we talk about things like having withheld pay, denial of pay, no written statement, no meal breaks, no safe water, all the way to threats or use of violence, which is really what we think of when we think of trafficking. And that 80% stays pretty consistent across that board. So 80% of those people didn't get paid what they were promised and 80% of those people had violence used or threatened against them in the workplace. And that is the spectrum of labor exploitation that we are facing as a nation, as a state, and in my personal experience as a local prosecutor. In order to understand this spectrum, uh, excuse me. Yes. This is what this is going to happen when you pique the interest of commissioners. That's fine. So I I I, I offer this uh, respectfully that when you get an interruption, it's because you've done something right. Okay, good. And so I have a commissioner uh, who has a question. Yeah. yeah just quickly, uh, you may have said it and I missed it, but eighty percent of whom is this happening to? This is of. Minimum wage workers. So, so you're saying 80% of minimum wage workers in the state of California, or is it? This was in the interview. Uh, this was in the, in the people that were part of this study, which included Chicago, Los Angeles, New York, 
and maybe Texas. Okay, so you're saying, but it sounds like you're saying 80% of people who make minimum wage have this happen to them. They don't get paid sure. what they're promised or there's violence threatened or imposed. Is that, Among is that... many other things, but yes, those kind of ends of the bell curve. Okay. Yeah. And I'll just pretend I'm back in law school. So that's cool. It's been a really long time, but I <laughs> think I court. can do it. Move yeah. court. It's move court. So um, to understand this spectrum, um, one of the things that this commission uh, recommended was a statewide governing group. Um, both Joe and I run a group like that in LA County. It's the uh, Labor Trafficking Subcommittee, which on Trong from the city attorney's office founded, headed, and grew into the most uh, influential policy and um, an academic, if you will, group looking at this issue across the nation. Um, that is a very important aspect of it. We get a multidisciplinary approach to this problem, everything from service providers to people who are working in prevailing wage in government, to prosecutors like me, to civil prosecutors like Joe. And what by doing that, we can sift through these issues as they come up. We can look at the data. We can look at where to focus our information. Um, Part, the next step from that is once you have those multidisciplinary groups, you can do education. Education for employers as well as employees. I sat in at a mess, uh, meeting last uh, yesterday for the Korean Immigrant Worker Association. And one of the things they talked about is about a quarter of the phone calls they get about wage theft and labor exploitation concerns are actually from employers who have nowhere to turn to ask these questions of, how much do I have to pay somebody? What is a labor violation? How do I make sure I give people the right number of um, rest breaks? And I have to tell you, having started a small business with my husband as a lawyer, I still don't know if I got everything right, okay? I had to file a couple things with the tax board because I did them late, you know, and I got terrified, but that's another question. But we need to make sure that employers also have a place to turn so they, if they wish to do the right thing, do the right thing before we expend money disciplining them for something they may not have even known they were doing. Yeah, let, this, let, me, let me go ahead. Tom and then, then yeah, uh, no, Commissioner Sidley. So the so I guess what what I'm to understand is if I want to operate a business, what is required of me as a business owner is I need a business license, I need capital to start the business. And if I need a location, I need a location. But with respect to other requirements and expectations of me as an employer in California, where is it that I get this information? And I think it is dispersed across multiple locations. And there are programs. Uh, I just happen to know, again, because of our small business, there's a small business association has like these centers. There's one at, at Pasadena Community College where you can go in and do these things. But we're asking for the, the example was coming up because we're in Koreatown. Okay, Koreatown has 700 restaurants in a two square mile location. It's one of the most dense restaurants in the nation or restaurant areas in the nation. Most of those are run by non uh, native uh, speakers and non uh, native born individuals. So you're asking them not only to figure out how to run a business, how to comply with labor laws, but you're asking them to do it in a foreign language with resources they never even knew existed and maybe still don't. And, and so that I think is a real problem that we have. But if we had a central board where it's like, hey, all your labor questions you can find here so I don't have to go to the Secretary of State and to public health and over here and over here, I think that could make a real difference. Commissioner Sidley has a question. So, so yeah, just where would you put that? Would I just, I get the idea. So do I put it on the back of the permit application where it's attached so it's all in one place? Where would you put that so it's most effective? You know, I hadn't thought of that because that's, you know, would have been a really good thing to think about. But, um, you know, I think, I think that would be a good way to do it. I think having um, these, we have what uh, public health, council in um, Koreatown that helps with all of these issues. So I think having local area 
um, subgroups that work with employers on labor trafficking. They could be a resource, but you could just have it on the Secretary of State. Everybody knows to go to the Secretary of State to register, right? I was desperately looking for a checklist for our business. Now, we don't have employees. We're a solo practitioner. I was looking for a checklist. I could not find one. I'm pretty tech savvy. Um, just a checklist that, hey, you're running a business? It's a restaurant? Here's a checklist of all the things you need from the state of California. And here's all the rules that you need. And have it in the main languages that we and you know, particularly have access. California now has so many small businesses. I mean, you you pointed to Koreatown, but um, many of the larger businesses have you know, cited in different states for various reasons, but we have an extraordinary large number of small businesses. So it might be good to think about that as a as a recommendation as to where to put it. Yeah. Commissioner Grossetti. Uh, before I ask you about uh, your 80% figure there, I have to make full disclosure uh, to the uh, commission that I hired this woman. <laughs> <laughs> so far, I hope you don't regret it, sir. Yeah, <laughs> and I have met Joseph before, but so we have good people in front of us. But question I have, as far as the state of California is involved, do you think that 80% figure is pretty accurate? I do, and I've seen similar figures across, um, across the data sets. So there's been multiple um, investigations, and I've seen that 80% uh, of people with, of minimum wage being victims of um, being underpaid, no overtime, things like that. So that consistency across different studies uh, does seem to make it. Uh, it's a shocking, shocking uh, number. I don't know if you're able to estimate this, rural versus city i mean what are most of the that 80 percent coming from cases in rural communities or in large cities or so this any city that was from cities it was from chicago la new york okay cities. okay the cities so we're talking about okay. cities in that data set um i can't uh, i don't have the other studies at the top of my head at this point so i can't tell you if those were statewide um I would imagine that it's either consistent or perhaps even higher, if especially once we get into things like agricultural. It wouldn't be surprising. You no, know, that would be my guess too. That's why I asked that rural would be re really substantial there. Why? But it's 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 important to think when you're thinking of that 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 figure that eighty percent. You're talking about a range of possible. Uh, things that could be implicated in that. It could just be the single, you're not being paid for, you know, 15 minutes of overtime on a consistent basis over two years, which adds up to actually a sure. lot of money, right? But all the way through 20 or 30 different types of things up to uh, actual out and out labor trafficking. So it, even though it's 80%, it, within that 80%, the breakdown of the most severe type of, mm -hmm. of violations, you know, labor trafficking, is is probably a much smaller subset of that, but we're but mm -hmm. but writ large in terms of as as Ryan put it, labor exploitation, they all fit under that rubric. Okay, you're you're going to re for, force me. I don't know if that's the word. Um, you're encouraging me to take a deeper dive into this because I was not here when you first uh, uh, testified, but as a subject matter that greatly interests me. Um, if any of us have housekeepers, we probably have heard of wage exploitation. Um, and it's not just with them, but with the husbands or the wives of your housekeepers that they experience it. And they don't know what to do. Do you have any idea at all of that 80 percent, how much in, involves intentionality on the part of the employer as opposed to I just didn't know? And I think that's where we we're not sure, right? And um, I don't have look the violence and threat of violence. Obviously, we're talking intention at all times. I would say on the other end, the wage theft. That's what we're talking about. About providing the education that we're providing can't just be for workers. Can't just be focused at the workers. Mm -hmm. Got to be focused at the employers. Because my feeling is, 
even after 25 years in the DA's office, that most people want to do the right thing if they have the information to do it for a variety of reasons, whether it's fear or just being the right you know, person, they want to do it right. So I suspect that number is uh, one of the things that I, uh, you know, that one of the points I want to make is we need to have a tiered step of how we attack this problem mm -hmm. so that we knock out that layer of, of negligence or uh, incompetence or just lack of education so that we are not expending energy and um, we're not expending resources on taking care of cases that literally, if they had that checklist or if they had access to that information or they had someone they could call, they would not be making those mistakes. Um, so that is the very first, that is the lowest level of work that we can do to reduce that number. Great, thank you. Commissioner Ariner has a question. Um, yes. I'm, can, it's interesting when um, Eric just said about, you know, if anybody, anybody has a housekeeper, right? And you hear family stories on a regular basis. So I'm interested in the demographics about who we're talking about, right? You mentioned, I mean, Koreatown is the largest um, Korea town in the in the world outside of Korea itself, right? There are at least a quarter of a million. It must be more by now. I presume it must be closer to three hundred thousand. Um, but the but one of the questions is: Are we talking mostly about an immigrant population where it's happening the most, right? Which means there's a language issue and all of that, um, and also coming from other countries that don't have the same rules and regulations and the trust of government. Right, um, all of those kinds of things. But I was thinking the very basic thing. Very often, when you walk into a small business, you'll see. Um, usually, it's a it's large. It's right. It's a large poster board, right, and it has the rules that tells the workers about what their rights are. Right. It's not focused on the employer. You're right. It's focused on the workers. But are we talking of now in the world of technology? Obviously, we're talking about other means, right? But it, some things can be very basic, right? Just putting up a sign in the appropriate language, obviously, right, for the workers there to say, here's what your rights are in regards to wages, hours, and working conditions, and, and all of that. At least that's what we used to do. I don't know if that still happens even. You, you mean, are there still these types of postings? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. they're required it, by law. Of right, course. that's right. And, and under under California Civil Code Section 52.6, there's also all these, a uh, bunch of listed businesses are supposed to post notices about human trafficking. Issues. Right. And and you know and then municipalities have been given the authority mm -hmm. under 52.6 to in fact um, institute their own uh, measures as long as they treat 52.6 as a floor, ah, not as a ceiling. Okay. So in LA County, we've 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 added to the list. There's 14 business or 14 types of businesses listed in 52.6 in LA County. We've uh, increased that to 25 businesses and locations that are listed. And the, the city of LA also has um, a, a, a similar measure that more or less mirrors 52.6. So, but those those types of requirements, postings, it, it, uh, uh, those laws still definitely exist and those postings are required. Right, and then I'm thinking um, for those of us that go to nail salons, for example, okay, um, and realize how many hours people are working and how many days a week people are working, right? They're all immigrants. Um, What's the role of the citizen in all of this, right? I'm Dion. I'm Dion. I'm sitting in that chair in the nail salon, right? And it's quite obvious to me what's happening. Do I have a role in this? Do I have a role that I you can... do? Okay, you do so indeed. let's. So, so the the law says, fifty two point six, as well as our local ordinances mm -hmm. say that the posting has to be public facing and employee facing. Mm -hmm. And if you and, and the implication is that if you can't put it in one place where both both sets of, of humans can see it, uh -huh. then you need to have two postings. But yes, it's there for, uh, for the public to see as well, mm -hmm. because if you see something, you have a way to say something. There's a hotline you can call. I'm not a man, but I'm, am I a mandated reporter? No. no. No, so that's not the same kind of a system as no. we have. Okay, all righty. But there is a role for the public to play that's an, that is anonymous? Yeah, definitely. And, and I mean, it, it, I mean, part of the the work of this commission and the work of uh, addressing this issue of trafficking generally labor trafficking mm -hmm. human trafficking generally is about raising awareness and that that is in your recommendations for right. the reports of course and and that's a critical part of all of this is is how to raise awareness on the part of the public about the 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 instances of this about the prevalence of of this type of activity 
and about the the nuances as well. I mean, it's not the case that, as I was saying, as we were saying to to uh, Commissioner Garcetti, uh, it's not the case that everyone is being trafficked right. when you were talking about that 80 percent. But when we're talking about that 80 percent, we're talking about everyone in that it falls under uh, uh, the, the rubric of somebody who's being exploited. Right. One way or right. The other. I just think that the term, the, cha the change of the terminology, right, to human exploitation, all of a sudden, I think um, makes many of us aware, right, because we were all focused on human trafficking. That's when we had the first hearing was about tra trafficking, right? We hadn't taught, we hadn't broadened that definition really until today, at least for me, right, um, to start thinking of, about that and how does the public think about it. Um, to expand on that, uh, part of the reason that exploitation, I think, is a is a better term is that when we think about it as trafficking, very little falls within trafficking, either is provable within trafficking, as you pointed out in the reports, or is prosecutable as trafficking. And trafficking really is not a, a problem that can be hand, honest to God, trafficking has to be at least somewhat law enforcement focused, because we are at that point talking about human slavery. And and you know removing people's uh, liberty, um, which is not something that civilly is really a workable item, but labor exploitation has a role for everyone in the government. So the reason I turn that over to Joe is because Joe worked very hard on getting that labor trafficking information as part of um, LA County, um, and yes, that is front facing. Um, as are we probably all traveled in a bathroom I don't know if it's in men's rooms as well but in women's rooms there's always stickers that say if you are traveling and you are not doing so free of free will you can call this number those signs make me I mean not happy that's be weird but you know those signs make me I'm glad to see them okay that is very important work but when we ignore all of the things that fall short of trafficking what we do is we create a world where a bi businesses are built on the back of backs of people who are infinitely uh, treated unfairly. And in answer to your question, I don't have the study in front of me, and I apologize for not having it. But um, there was a study that showed that uh, that um, obviously the vast majority of minimum wage workers, which is not going to come as a surprise, are non citizens. Uh, undocumented individuals, non-English speaking as a first language, women, um, s people of color, and single mothers. Um, so the people who have the least resources possible are the most likely to be victims of wage theft, are most likely to lose part of their income, are most likely to not be able to afford to object to being treated unfairly in their jobs. And this study, and again, I can provide it later um this study uh, appro said approximately that of those people the number that were under the rate of poverty because of their lack of pay that if they were paid merely what they were entitled to under minimum wage they'd be above the poverty level 30 percent of them it's a stunning number and it's a stunning number when you realize how much we're paying to subsidize these businesses that are underpaying their people so we're the ones who are picking up the costs of these businesses. Um, as I put in my written statement, um, we could, so your question, I'm sorry, I'm going to backtrack a bit. You asked, okay, can, can you call? Yes. Who do you call? And once we call, who's going to do something about it? Um, and this is my little soapbox. Joe's heard it. Poor thing. Um, we have a labor commissioner's office. That is really the central repository, and they work incredibly hard. I, they are my colleagues. I work with them daily. The work they do is nigh on miraculous. They have 19,000 complaints that come in a year. They have two criminal level prosecutors, uh, two criminal level investigators. They have less than 400 civil investigators across the state. They are mandated to have those reports done within 90 days because of their backlog, not because of a lack of work. And I would testify to that under oath. It's taking them approximately 500 days to get to each investigation. That's just the ones of people who are willing to call. 
we know that people of color, um, people who are not here legally, people who are perhaps here legally but are not fully documented, people who need that job to make sure their kids don't go hungry that night, we know they're not calling. There are certain cultures. We know they are not calling. And so of those 1,900, I mean 19,000, who knows how many there are? As I compared in my written statement, and um, compare that to the number of insurance investigators, you know, sworn insurance investigators in the state of California. And there's over 260 sworn law enforcement level investigators for insurance fraud. Mm. But we have two for wage theft, the largest financial crime in the world. So we have a place to call. You can call the labor commissioner's office and I swear to you, they will get to it. Can I ask you just a quick question of the, what's the percentage when you finish the investigation that something was wrong? That I don't know uh, um, what their numbers are. Um, I do know that Cal Matters in 2017 found that 17% of the people had paid their labor commissioner fines within a year of being levied on. Mr. So I don't know how many of those are. I mean, um, 19,000 complaints, but you know, oh, three of them were something real. No. I mean, I just don't know. I, that's why I was just asking, like, there, what is it? There are, uh, we don't have those numbers offhand necessarily, but there are a spectacular number of cases that have, have actually been adjudicated and have a court judgment that haven't been enforced. And they don't get enforced because, uh, you know, the judgment enforcement unit of, of the Department of Industrial Relations is over, they're right. just overburdened like everyone right. else. They have to, to their oh, credit and to the credit of the state uh, Sorry. infrastructure, they have augmented their judgment enforcement unit recently. I think they've opened up two or three new offices and, and they're working toward right. dealing with these outstanding judgments. But these are judgments <laughs> that they've gone already all the way to final judgment and they're still no, not I mean, getting their money. That's so, a terrible problem of, you know, somebody's judgment proof and all of that. I mean, I we've it's terrible. No, absolutely. They go bankrupt, whatever, and they aren't paying. It's not that they're judgment proof. It's, it's that not. they refuse to pay. They refuse to pay. There is no, there is an enforcement. But that's not what you're talking about. That's Your 19,000 is somebody calling yeah. pre. And I, so I was just curious. Correct. And the answer is we don't know the number offhand Correct. right now. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I, think, I think Commissioner Garcetti has his light on. Yes, thank you. Got it. <clears throat> is it a good idea? The Labor Commissioner is a state official. Would it be a good idea to decentralize this and have every county have a labor commissioner? No. Not wait, wait a minute. Well, one is thinking about it. One is saying no. Give me both of your input well, on this. You want to go first? Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> the the thing is that there's a there's a there's a bill already that's just went into the suspense file in the in appropriations in the Senate, but had made it out of the assembly. It's AB 380, and that bill was designed to create. Uh, a, a labor trafficking enforcement unit within DIR, um, the Department of Industrial Relations, and it it it, it was a, a rebirth of a bill uh, that that actually was on uh, on the list that that of, of bills that that this commission thought would be helpful. Uh, in any case, uh, it's hard to say. You're you're talking about using that. There's a choice that we have is using available existing infrastructure and, and, and administrative capabilities and, and, and not repurposing them and maybe augmenting their purpose. And then on the other hand, actually creating a whole new agency and a whole new set of agencies across the state with offices in every single county. Now that might, that might ultimately be the answer, but I would, I would suggest, you know, from, a, from the standpoint of just kind of uh, rational path, is to try a central coordinating unit in DIR that is there to be the brains for the whole entire state and, and give it a chance to actually work. And the problem is that we haven't tried anything. Ryan and I, and, and, and on as well, and other 
hardworking public servants across the, the state, in the Central Coast, uh, in the Northern California, there's there's labor traffic, there's human trafficking task forces uh, across the state, and there are people who are working hard and and kind of edging closer to these to the same kinds of of understandings that we have, which is that you have to have data, you have to have a central coordinating, you have to have uh, uh, you have to rely on your sister agencies within your county. So, you know, we have DC, the Department of Consumer and Business Affairs. We have the treasurer and tax collector who deals with business licensing. We have regional planning who deals with permits. We have the Department of Public Health that deals with health and safety violations. All of these agencies are capable of being trained up in recognizing and, and looking for signs of human trafficking, as well as looking at their data that they're already gathering to see and, and synthesize it with an eye toward looking for evidence of human trafficking. And and I, I, I mean, we have a person, Nancy O'Malley, who was a former DA of, right. of Alameda County, who is now retired, but who did amazing work for 20 years. And what we all learned from her is that you don't look for labor trafficking it's not going to be there in front of you. You have to look at you have to look for the adjacent violations, right? So you're looking for tax evasion, you're looking for insurance fraud, mm -hmm. you're looking for wage violations, you're looking for health and safety violations. If they agglomerate these various types of, of violations, there starts to be a sense that hey, what, well, what's going on here? The problem is that we don't have a central coordinating body. We don't have a unit that's looking for that data or looking at data that we already have with this lens to see whether maybe we need to take a harder look at this particular business or this particular industry because these things are consistently happening but if they're not going to do in the state if i understand it correctly if it goes in the suspense area you're not going to hear about it this year it's it's over it's done. okay then so why shouldn't the county if los angeles is motivated by this that we want to start our own right here in los angeles what's wrong with that and and they exist and that's basically what Joe and I have been doing, right? Uh, that's what on has done. We have created, because they don't exist, we've made them happen. But how many investigators do you have? Well, we don't but have, we don't have, I have one. <laughs> I now have one as of September 6th. The DA's office now has one assigned investigator. But the problem, of course, with that, right, is that uh, it's what, what I call personality over progress. I am a strong personality and so um you know i brought these people together i created wage theft groups i you know called up people and you know said i need you to be invest my investigator i've called personal favors from sheriffs you know to get cases done that's not a workable solution obviously <laughs> um and even my concern is well what happens if i get transferred to drug court right does everything go away if the personality who cares sure. about it isn't there? And that's the concern I have with this, um, that we have not had a process in place and it has taken, Nancy O'Malley did amazing work. It has changed when she left, you know? I mean, she leaves office and the new electeds, uh, electeds have different priorities as they should. But we should not. But somebody getting their fair wage should not be dependent on whether or not there's somebody there who's willing to read the the report, or a police officer who's willing to take the police report, or a public health officer who decides that they are going to look at those things. I was sitting at a meeting last night and heard a public health officer say, "Well, we see stuff, but it's not our job, and we don't know what to do with that information." I, I actually quoted that from a, an FDA. We don't know what to do with that information. And that would be the problem with having, you know, not having a centralized body is that that information dies if there's nowhere to put it. Um, I have a question. Um, the labor commissioner, you said two investigators? Right now, uh, there are two criminal investigators, one for Northern California, okay. one for Southern California. But then, but then there are uh, 260 sworn insurance investigators, right? Correct. Okay. Now, do you know where the funding comes from for the 260 sworn in insurance investigators? I do know that there is grant funding from the insurance uh, from insurance companies to pay for the California Department of Insurance, uh, both for district attorneys to prosecute or for 
Yeah, for prosecutors as well as investigators. Right. So what's hap so what happens is the insurance industry, in order to minimize the incidence of fraud, tax themselves. Correct. So that the funding is there to hire additional investigators, as compared to a labor commissioner, where the businesses do not want to tax themselves to hire more investigators to investigate them. I would say that is actually short-sighted of those businesses because that what happens is, is they are then competing in an unfair, uh, unfairly against people who don't pay their wages. But I, I don't think a business community is going to listen to that. However, as I indicated in my written statements, there are funding streams that we are ignoring, that we are losing. Um, Robert Reich, and I'm, I, I swear to God, I'm going to email the man because I can't find his site for this posted that for every dollar a minimum wage person loses, $1.20 goes into the economy. Um, if we have the tax revenue just from those who are not, if 80% of people at some point are losing part of their revenue, if we're losing $3 billion a year in wage theft, that's wage theft. We're not talking about the spectrum. We're literally talking about not being paid what you are owed just for wages, not overtime, not all of that. $3 billion is, um, I had the figure in my written notes about uh, just a year back in 2010, and it was something like $14 million. That's just from a small percentage of those cases, as, as the commissioner was pointing out. I don't know how many there actually are, or how many were you know, beneficial, but the taxes alone would more than overwhelmingly pay for an increased uh, system. Plus the fact that right now, the way that civil prosecution works of these cases. So when we have big companies that do this, we don't go after them criminally. We use the 17200 of the business and profession codes to sue them. And part of what we do from those lawsuits is we get fees and fines from them. Those fines pay for consumer protection across the, uh, the state of California. We are se literally self-funding consumer protection. There's absolutely no reason why that same model can't be used for large companies that are committing wage theft. I mean, 17200 is a, is a wobbler, so you could charge it as criminal or civil, but, but that's beside the point. Um, didn't you also say there were 400 civil investigators, or did I mishear that? 400 civil investigators. 400 administrative, civil. Administrative, administrative investigators. And those people then can find these businesses. They just aren't doing a prosecution, of a criminal prosecution. So but they do investigations of the businesses, provide those investigations to labor commissioner hearings. Then they go to hearing. They have due process rights. They can argue those. And then the hearing officers can set, um, if they are findings, then they set a judgment. Okay. And the only reason I bring up 17200, I, I was in the city attorney's office and we put our 17200 division in the criminal division. Um, it ultimately moved back over to the civil, but it is, it is wobbler. It could go either way. So just let me indicate it's, we're at um, 15 minutes before the hour. We've had another witness that's uh, available at 1.30. So if you need another five minutes to wrap, or, or if you think this is a good uh, 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 juncture to, to, conclude your testimony. Um, well, I would like to just, if you please, um, just take a step back um, and, and, and come, take that as they say, the 30,000 foot view. Um, and, and, and this is in regards to just our general understanding and approach to labor trafficking writ large. And, and we're, we're really um, at the ground level here. We are starting to embrace um, a, a different type of paradigm. We're not uh, abandoning law enforcement. Obviously, nobody is suggesting that because as Ryan rightly points out, there are some bad guys. However, in terms of how to get at the issue of labor trafficking and how to really abate it, how to reduce it, um, we can't wait for bad things to happen. We need to be more aggressive. We need to take a public health style approach, of, uh, an approach of intervention, of prevention, of education and community outreach. And uh, this, this is not necessarily a brand new idea. There's even a book called A Public Health Approach to Human Trafficking. It just came out. So it's in, in some sense, it is very new. But what we're, what we're 
really trying to embrace is how to do that, how to really uh, connect with our community, be in the community, and 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 have our people out there so that there's more there, the community is being uh, alerted to and enlightened about the existence of this phenomenon, as well as creating spaces where people who are being victimized can come and uh, can talk about what's happening to them. So for instance, um, uh, in partnership with, with other agencies, we're, um, we're working on the idea of a pilot uh, wor worker resource center, which would be designed uh, for workers in, in, a, in, a in a community where there's a high concentration of certain migrants, right? So we're, we're thinking of starting in Monterey Park where there's a very high concentration of Chinese migrant workers. To have a resource center where these people can come and they can, for instance, get mail because they, they can't even get their mail and, it, it, you know, except that these places that are called residential hotels, which are basically rooming houses, which are illegal and which are places where they cannot leave any of their possessions. And this happens on a scale that w is actually kind of mind blowing at, at the level of thousands of people, tens of thousands of people every day to basically we're suggesting and we're trying ourselves. We're not waiting around for somebody to give us permission, although we do need some permission to do it and we definitely need funding, uh, but we're, we're all working hard to figure out how to do this. So we're working with our community-based organization partners to figure out how to do this. But it's really about um, the idea, which really this, this commission has, has already embraced. And I think uh, law enforcement really has embraced too, these concepts of being trauma-informed and victim-centered in your approach mm -hmm. to this. So what is it to be trauma-informed and victim-centered? It's to be getting information from the people who are being victimized, which is essentially what you're doing when you're coming at something from a public health standpoint. You need to understand what is happening before you can address the problem. So, um, and, and I'm mindful that I don't have much time and I, and I broached a giant subject here, but I really just wanted to put it out there as food for thought. Um, I would be happy, happy to provide you with uh, some scholarly articles, with a, this book that I have, um, with, with uh, experts who have really been thinking a lot about this. The Office of Women's Health at the Department of Public Health in Los Angeles County has been, has been focused on this idea and this concept for a long time, and they've done some excellent work uh, behind it. So I would just um, ask you to, um, as my time is running out, as our time is running out, to um, just take this idea and, and noodle on it and, and if you like, as I say, I'd be happy to provide some scholarly articles that can really flesh out this, this notion of a public health approach to this, to this problem, because if we can't just wait until bad things happen is the point. We need to get in there and perform intervention. We need to have people understand that when somebody is not it, when somebody is forcing them to do something, that's not that's not how we do things in this country. That's not how it happens. But we have to do this in a way that's, as we say, culturally informed, linguistically informed, which are other two other buzz terms which have great amounts of uh, reality underpinning them. To come to to come to somebody who is from a different culture and just say, well, that's unjust. Well, yeah, our sense of what justice is, is is in America is one thing, but what justice means in another culture can be something entirely different. And if we're not able to communicate across those cultural barriers, then we lose, and the and the traffickers win. And essentially, the traffickers win when we don't collaborate and when we don't share information. And so our main message is to 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 continue to um, work with sister agencies. To, to incorporate the existing infrastructure and direct some of that energy in the existing infrastructure toward this issue. Commissioner Garcetti, and then uh, we'll go to our next witness. Both of you are a superb example of an issue that we discussed over lunch. And that is the effectiveness of expert witnesses who read their testimony that we've already read, but they read it, that's how they take their time. And those, who use their written testimony to speak as you have without you know, reading parts of your report, but sharing with us both your expertise and your passion for this issue. Thank you. And let me offer uh, uh, gratitude on behalf of the commission for your testimony. I apologize if I seem abrupt, but somebody's got to make the trains run on time. <laughs> Thank We're you. used to it. We're lawyers. Yeah, thank you. Judges tell us what to do and we do it. Sort of. 
kind of. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next witness this afternoon is, is Lee LaChapelle. Uh, Lee is the Associate Director of Survivor Advocacy at the Coalition to Abolish Slavery and Trafficking, or CAST, in Los Angeles. In their role, they support lived experience leadership programming and lead local, state, and federal public policy initiatives. Thank you for joining us. When you're ready, you may please begin your testimony. Hello, Commissioners. Thank you so much for having us here today so that we can Talk Lee, about if I can, if I can interrupt you just for a moment, we need to turn up the volume in the in the hall here. Uh, okay, I think we're back now. Go ahead, Lee. All right, is that better? Yes, even a little louder, Sheriff. Thank you, Lee. Go ahead. Of course, thank you. Um, I really appreciate being here today. My name is Lee LaChapelle. I'm with the Coalition to Abolish Slavery and Trafficking. We are one of the nation's oldest and largest nonprofits, and we have everything from 24-hour crisis response, direct services, that's the team I started in, all the way to legal services, case management, housing, and our goal really is to bridge the gap between direct services, people on the front lines working with clients, to our advocacy, public policy, training, and outreach. Um, we were really involved in the initial 2020 reports and its focus on labor trafficking, and we are so incredibly thankful that uh, the commission brought such a focus in the state to labor trafficking because historically it's been overlooked despite globally being a very, very large issue. Um, we've made some progress. I wrote quite a lot about it, um, but what we have faced as our biggest barrier is uh, the state's uh, inability to fund the needed services and programming. We've tried several times legislatively to you know, do the California multidisciplinary on it's on the state level, the um, you know, labor unit within the civil rights department. We've been trying since 2019 for a prevalent study that actually addresses labor trafficking. And all of these things have gone unfunded and we always get stuck in the appropriations process. Um, and I know you probably heard this morning, but another funding issue that we are running up against is the Federal Victims of Crime Act of which California is the largest recipient, is at a $700 million you know, shortfall relative to fiscal year 2023. And that is going to mean that thousands of service providers across the state are gonna go unfunded this year. Those that serve children, um, elderly adults, human trafficking, survivors, domestic and sexual violence. And this is the number one issue as we're using these reports and all of our work and pointing to them and saying, this is what needs to be done. Everyone agrees that it's what needs to be done, but funding is definitely our, our biggest barrier. Um, and, um, other, okay. Were you going to offer additional testimony? I don't want to interrupt you. Uh, oh yeah, but I mean, if you do need to interrupt, please do. I know the technical uh, the delay can be a little bit much, but um, yeah. Uh, we have had some really great successes. Um, I think they were also highlighted during you know, the, the testimony before me about the collaboration that these reports have led to. Um, so in 2021, we worked with the Department of Consumer and Business Affairs to do a really incredible project um, where we actually did a lot of survivor-informed collaboration on public-facing outreach materials related to labor trafficking. Because uh, many, I mean, many public-facing materials, those posters we've talked about, um, aren't survivor informed, they're not designed by survivors, survivors aren't consulted in the process. So a lot of these workers' rights outreach materials, human trafficking materials, are not reaching the intended audiences because those audiences are never consulted. So we were a really big part of bringing survivor voices to these projects related to the human trafficking ordinance. And we worked closely with the Department of Labor, Public Health, City and District Attorney's offices, and Los Angeles County Council, all of whom have a lot of passion and excitement for addressing labor trafficking holistically. And we were able to train a lot of different county inspectors. We've worked with the Civil Rights Department closely as they've shifted from the Department of Fair Housing or Fair Employment and Housing turned into Civil Rights Department 2022. We've worked with them a lot, but there still needs to be additional outreach so that organizations and survivors understand that that department is there uh, to address labor trafficking. And uh, a huge success for us was working with the Los Angeles County Office of Child Protection Training Program on the human trafficking of children, because previously it has not fully addressed the labor trafficking of minors, which is a huge issue that has come into you know, the public's attention with different articles about you know, migrant children and uh, work conditions that are you know, reaching the levels of trafficking. 
uh, but now available in that program for all county officials and those that work with, you know, minors and traditional age youth. There's courses specifically on the labor trafficking of children. There's courses specifically on forced criminality, which is when survivors are forced to commit crimes as a part of their trafficking um, and the way that that impacts their ability to access healing. The commission also made... Commissioner Sidley has a question. Yeah. So, uh, Lee, thank you so much for your work in this area. I, I'm wondering, actually, as you've discussed your biggest concern, which is going to be the um, VAWA money going away uh, or lessening the output, um, given the synergy, bad word, but the reality of immigration and trafficking children, they all sort of go together. Um, is there a possibility to look and work with Homeland Security? And, and what are you doing with, with immigration groups to coordinate? Can your dollars go farther? Is there a policy that, that can help to make your, your policies and your, your priorities go farther without getting additional funds? The agencies that receive uh, CAL OES funding, this is how the BOCA funding is distributed, it's distributed through the state. Um, a lot of those nonprofits that get that funding do not have the kind of staffing or experience or ability to apply for or manage federal funding. State funding is, tends to be very low barrier. Um, the reporting process is lower, the application process is a bit easier. Um, and so a lot of these nonprofits are not gonna be able to pivot to different types of federal funding uh, because they're just not equipped or staffed enough to have the development teams that are needed to kind of manage that funding. CAST does work with you know, all kinds of immigration services, um, especially on the government level to talk funding, outreach, identification, all of these things. The VOCA funds in particular are going to impact not just trafficking, but domestic violence, sexual violence. And even though all of these topics intersect with immigration, um, it can be very challenging when the populations don't overlap perfectly to kind of receive that funding. Thank you. Thank you, please continue. Of course. Um, one of the commission's uh, key recommendations that CAST was um, a big fan of and, and worked really hard to further was the recommended uh, increased use of civil remedies. So we have a full scale legal team and we are very blessed to be able to, to provide that service for survivors in Los Angeles. And we've always emphasized the full scope of civil remedies available to human trafficking survivors. Um, but a new initiative that we have is we have started an impact litigation unit that's dedicated to pursuing groundbreaking legal strategies, to champion kind of economic and social justice issues for survivors in California. So we have attorneys and lived experience experts that are trying to work specifically within trafficking within the agricultural sector. That is where we are hoping to win our first landmark case, uh, but the impact litigation unit in and of itself is going to be focused on all industries in which human trafficking is occurring to shift practices, policies, and legislation around those industries as a preventative measure. And we're trying to pursue civil remedies as a form of prevention as well. And I mean, when we're approached about, you know, like how relevant are, are, are all of these recommendations out of the commission's reports? Um, and has that need for those recommendations increased? Has it decreased? You know, as we are entering a different era of the you know, COVID-19 pandemic, what does that look like? And we have seen nothing but an increased need for these report recommendations to be seen through. One in five of our clients between July 2022 and June 2023 experienced labor trafficking. We've seen a 15% increase um, in clients served uh, in the past two years. Uh, and our emergency response program has seen a 15% increase this year. And that's sex and labor trafficking survivors calling for assistance escaping from their trafficking situations from our 24 hour team. And we have uh, 28 individuals on our wait list for legal services at this time. And these are mostly survivors who are looking for T visas, criminal record clearance, asylum assistance, all of the necessary legal services. Um, and we're one of the only service providers that is able to provide those services. And legal services are one of the services that are potentially going to be cut with this VOCA funding cut um, that is coming towards California in the next year. CAS does have some broad recommendations. Uh, the way that we think about human trafficking, and I really wanna highlight that um, 
the testimony before me that it is really important that we think about human trafficking as just, a, you know, the end of that bell curve of workers' rights violations, because um, that's really what human trafficking is. Um, but we do think of human trafficking not just necessarily as a criminal legal system issue, because we find a lot of our clients are re-traumatized and criminalized when they're going through the criminal legal system. And this is leading to increased barriers to them accessing the things that they need to heal, like safe housing, public benefits, safe immigration. Um, and we see human trafficking kind of as the criminal expression of political and economic disenfranchisement. So what we're trying to do is pursue legislation and policies and practices that strengthen the political and economic power of these groups that are most often targeted. And so we really recommend that our state especially shift away from only seeing success of like the number of convictions and arrests, but also seeing success in the number of trafficking survivors utilizing services, obtaining legal relief like lost income and T visas and civil litigation relief. Um, and we do also want to do a huge emphasis on forced criminality. It's something Cass talks about a lot because that's what we're seeing in a lot of our clients, especially our labor trafficking clients is that traffickers are utilizing our system, the criminal legal system, to ensure survivors are arrested, have criminal records, because then they are easier to control because they don't have access to the services that they need. They don't have access to public benefits or safety. Um, and we really just encourage, you know, the Little Hoover Commission and California as a whole to continue to address labor trafficking through a human rights framework and a public health lens. Uh, that's trauma-informed and evidence-based and most importantly kind of brings together a diversity of survivor voices, especially those that are often at the table in these conversations around human trafficking, those that have been criminalized, um, and those who just have different experiences navigating the criminal legal system. Uh, but we do thank the Commission for championing labor trafficking advocacy in California and allowing us to provide testimony today and answer questions. Thank you very much. Uh, turning to my fellow commissioners, any other additional questions or comments? No, seeing none, um, let me uh, express appreciation uh, from the commission for your testimony and for the work that you do and taking the time to join us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next witness today is Summer Steffen. Summer was appointed as the San Diego County's district attorney in 2017 and was elected by voters to the position in 2018 and again in 2022. Thank you for joining us. When you are ready, you may please begin your testimony. Ms. Stephan, are Good you afternoon, uh, commissioners. Thank you. It's a pleasure to join you again. I was part of the, had the privilege to be part of the uh, Hoover Commission's meetings and, uh, and creation of the different reports. It was a wonderful opportunity that I joined with my uh, chief of the human trafficking division and um, coming back full circle to report back. Um, I think we've made a lot of progress in San Diego County. I've been a prosecutor for 33 years, pioneered the human trafficking division um, years ago and the sex crimes division. Um, and the focus, as you well know, this is why the Hoover um, Commission focused on labor trafficking as a lot of attention was brought to sex trafficking. And in San Diego, we created models that um, are looked at as some of the gold standard models in a sex trafficking. But uh, as much as we had uh, tried different things, I would say we did not have much success in labor trafficking. But um, after the Hoover Commission meetings, we, um, we uh, opened our lens and we looked at the issues uh, with uh, bringing our partners in to discuss how we can implement some of these recommendations as well as um, leap forward in the area of protecting the vulnerable in the area of labor trafficking. And 
um, I have to say it, 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 we're on a pretty good path right now. In fact, we were kind of been now invited to be a part of a Harvard commission on workplace justice. Uh, we've had many calls from different offices looking at uh, what we created here that seems to be working. I think in a couple of years, I'll be able to give you an even more concrete report but here's the essence of what we did is we, as the speaker before me um, indicated that human labor trafficking is on a continuum. It is the far end of the worst abuse of workers uh, and workplace justice issues. The standard to prosecute a labor trafficking case, whether a child or an adult, requires force, fraud, and coercion, which are high standards and things that our victims, because of language barriers and, and just their life experience and the countries they come from, they don't really understand. They're only looking at whether they were locked in a box or beaten daily. They don't really understand the, the coercion that is really at the heart of, you know, most of labor, the labor trafficking cases, the implicit threats of immigration, other things. So they can't verbalize those things to us. So in creating, we I created uh, in late 2020, a workplace justice division. Um, we still have our human trafficking division and they work seamlessly hand in hand. But the workplace justice division targets every kind of workplace uh, abuse from wage theft to um, tax roll of fraud to workers comp fraud to um, to different issues involving breaks and the number of hours and overtime pay and tips and all of the things. And at the other end of the continuum is labor trafficking so that we're never telling a victim that we can't help you because you don't reach the threshold of force, fraud, um, coercion, but we are saying yes to, we can help this victim. So with creating that, since that time, we also created materials because awareness was a big part of it in English and Spanish. Um, and these materials, as you could see here, uh, which we're happy to send the commission, went far and wide to all of our labor organizations, our victim services, our family justice centers, our government offices that, and they have an easy way to report because you really can't, in most cases, call 911 in a labor trafficking case. It doesn't usually look like a 911 call. So it gives them a direct place to call at the DA's office. And I am very grateful that we have developed a great trust with our community. Um, an email, a number to call, um, they will receive a call back. And we've received a hundred, in, in, since we started the Workplace Justice Division, we, um, we have opened 101, 101 criminal investigations, uh, 101. And um, of those, we filed 10 cases, and there are nine more cases brewing right now um, that are on the bubble of being filed. Because as you start something new, it's in year three that you start springing forward. So this is quite the outcomes for a short period of time. We were insistent on recovering restitution. So we've recovered $111,500 in restitution for the victims for um, wage theft, um, pay uh, discrepancies, and other things. Um, we um, have uh, two labor trafficking cases, one in domestic servitude and the other in a in a big industry that I'm not going to talk about because uh, the case is on the verge of um, going forward and I, I don't want to tip off anybody. Um, in addition um, to 
this workplace justice, which, like I said, does looks at um, wage, looks at crimes, at at labor trafficking in this continuum, and addresses it with a yes uh, to helping uh, victims. Uh, victim services were enhanced in this area. We brought to our family justice center. Uh, you rise and um, Casa Cornelia, the Mexican consulate um, as a partner, all of the different agencies that would build trust with victims and would help them feel safe to report and feel safe to receive services. That has been an a very successful model. We worked with Catholic Charities. I filmed a PSA with uh, the uh, the bishop uh, in San Diego, who um, you know who has a lot of trust, especially in the in our um, immigrant Catholic communities, to invite and to to help victims understand that they can come forward. Um, we did a lot, a lot of training to every kind of partner from our labor organizations, our unions, our um, county offices, our health and human services, everywhere where we can um, have a victim walk in and be seen for what is going on with them. Uh, so I think a lot of progress since uh, our Hoover Commission uh, meetings. Um, I think we created a model that can be looked at statewide, this model of workplace justice on a continuum with labor trafficking. Um, and we've built a lot of great relationships. Um, I, I will um, stop and, and see if there are any questions. I have uh, a lot more detail that I can answer, but uh, I'm happy to respond. Uh, thank you. Commissioner Garcetti has a question. Good afternoon, uh, the District Attorney. You and I have never met, but it's a real pleasure to meet you. I love for talking to what I consider to be very forward thinking uh, of prosecutors and certainly the elected District Attorney. So thank you for all you're doing. I do have some specific questions. Tell me more about your Workplace Justice Division. How large is it? How many investigators? Who are the lawyers you selected uh, for this? Tell us more about your victims. Are they primarily Latino? And what are you doing if it goes beyond Latino? I mean, how are you working with the media to do it? I'm going to give you at the end of this one idea you probably haven't been exposed to, but let's, if you would, give me yes. more information before I give you my idea. Absolutely. Um, so the specific workplace justice unit has two deputy district attorneys um, full time working on just this issue. It also has two investigators and it has a paralegal and, um, you know, the staff that supports it. But the important thing is that this is just the core unit, but they also work with the human trafficking unit that has about eight prosecutors assigned, investigators, victim advocates, and staff. And also they work you know, very routinely with our regional human trafficking task force that we established in 2016. And this is a 24 seven task force. So they're constantly vetting the cases through the task force. They're leveraging additional task force resources in order to be able to move forward uh, with the cases. We, most of our victims, yes, um, are um, Latino victims. Um, and, uh, but we, we also see um, some of our API community victims are some of the investigations, especially in the area of elder care and elder care facilities, where we do see some of our API community uh, being drawn in for a nursing type job that turns into a nightmare of, um, you know, work that is day after day, night after night. Um, and so, so, so that's my brief okay. answer. And I'm looking forward to your idea. Thank you. I'll, I'll hold off on the idea. I still haven't finished with my questions, but tell me, so the, 
we all understand you've indicated uh, a, what I consider to be a significant uh, personnel to these areas, but what is your total lawyer personnel so we have a better idea? I mean, do you have 700 lawyers in your office and you've taken this or do you have 200 or, or 100? How many do you have? We're the second largest DA's office in California. So I have 330 deputy district attorneys. Okay. Uh, about eight assigned to do human trafficking cases, two specific to this continuum of workplace justice. And you have dedicated uh, investigators who work for the district attorney's office? Yes, I have 120 investigators. That's a good number, uh, by all by itself. Yes. Uh, cases that you're prosecuting, what is your goal in prosecuting? I mean, you, you talked about restitution, but you didn't mention anything about any deterrent effect that uh, fines or, or jail time might have. Is that in that picture of what you seek? Yes, yeah. um, absolutely. Uh, case that you're yeah. handling. Oh, yes, uh, absolutely. There's accountability. There's jail time. Um, there's uh, some significant um, jail time, five, six years in in one case. Um, so uh, human trafficking cases, of course, have additional, sure. you know, jail time, prison time. Uh, but the but the restitution is if we're going to give probation and give someone a chance to learn and, you know, spend jail time under a year and get probation, then they have to pay the restitution up front. That's our leverage is to return those lost monies so people can put food on the table to the victims immediately. So we we don't we well. I would say not never because it depends on the evidence in the case, but we we try to not negotiate probation unless we can get make the victim as whole as possible. And did you get this funding specifically for these positions or did you just have your staff and you rearranged the staff and you took them and created these positions? So I I planned on doing this anyhow, but I was very, by diverting resources that I had, because this was a priority for me, um, human trafficking has always been a priority for me, but I went to the board of supervisors, they were very um, receptive and, and asked for, um, you know, one uh, position of one DA and one investigator. I then added my own, but I wanted to make sure that um, I fortify the unit and I was given those positions. Excellent. In addition to that, the, the county did one better. They formed um, an, uh, an office to complement uh, my efforts, an office um, of uh, labor standards and ethics. Um, and we work very symbiotically with that county office. That office sets standards for labor contracts, and they also receive ethics violations that may not amount to a criminal violation by um, employers. And they communicate with us and refer cases to us um, that seem a lot more fishy or a lot more substantive. And we do the same when we're when a case doesn't rise to the level of criminal, we'll refer it to them to basically send like a scary letter to the employer about their practices and improving their practices. Um, so we receive our referrals from that office, also from the Department of Industrial Relations. We have an excellent relationship with our labor commissioner, Lilia Garcia Brower, and we actually, work with each other and go to each other's offices to look at cases um, where where people are well beyond the administrative remedy and really requires to get to get uh, the DA's attention. And we work that way back and forth on the cases together. It sounds like you really know how to work the system to most effectively help uh, the people you're, you're seeking help. So congratulations there. Thank you. Uh, idea for you. Uh, it's it's actually going to be two because it's going to be two ideas. One that's brand new, just coming out of this hearing today. First idea was is how do you get the attention and confidence of the communities being victimized? 
I had this in a different situation when I was district attorney in Los Angeles, but it applies here too, I think. And that is, yeah, you, you can write an op-ed piece in La Pignon, you can be interviewed once or twice, but that is fleeting and you have to build credibility. And so I called together the writers and producers of Telenovos and said, you have an obligation. And we were at that time talking about dropout, the kids who were drop out of school, starting in grade school, they drop out. And I said, you have to give mothers as well as fathers, you have to empower them through your stories about why they should work to keep their kids in school. Just because I didn't, the father or mother speaking, uh, complete school doesn't mean that, you know, I'm not a good person and I'm supporting my family. They don't have to go to school. Well, we all know the benefits of school. The same thing here. You can, if you can convince them to put this in telenovelas where it's kind of a theme mm. uh, where, hey, God, it was my uncle. Now you're being victimized. we got to do something about this. Mm -hmm. And how do you do it? And let them put in the fact, well, your local DA is probably equipped to do it, but you have to go and talk to them. If you don't do something about it, it's going to continue. And we're going to be continue to be victimized. The new idea is, I don't know if it's telenovelas or how, but we heard today that many, uh, I don't say, maybe many is an exaggeration. There a good number of employers do not know the rules, do not know exactly what they are supposed to do under California law. Well, how do you get that out? Maybe you can, if there is a business weekly or if there is an association where you can go and speak or have your representatives go and speak to lay out because most entrepreneurs, business people want to work within the law. Uh, there's some who are intentionally going to try and steal and do all kinds of things with their employees, but most want to, but they need to know. And as one person said here, one of the lawyers said, started a new business, said, I couldn't figure out what's expected of me in the law in terms of paying the responsibilities I had as an employer, and I couldn't find any place so I could do it. So maybe this is something that you could help the the employer community in, and I think they would appreciate that, that you're going out. I'm not interested in prosecuting you. I'm interested in protecting the community and protecting you. You don't want to be prosecuted. Just follow the law, but you need to know the law. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I, I take these to heart. Um, I tried I tried the harder way. This is an easier way. I tried to pass a bill uh, about the Workers' Bill of Rights um, yeah. that employers have to give to their employers when they come to work, uh, that tell them their rights, um, um, especially for the immigrant community in the language they understand that they don't have to give up their documents, they can just have a copy of their document. That didn't pass. I thought it was a really good idea, but this part of just educating them, I don't need a law to do, no. and, and I will pursue it and hopefully report some positive uh, news to you, uh, Commissioner. Yeah, that would be Seddy. great. And Thank certainly, you. if you ever need to use my name personally, not as the Little Hoover Commission, but personally in your effort on the Bill of Rights for Workers, uh, please feel free to do so. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I'm looking at uh, commissioners. I see no further questions or comments. I understand that we got uh, you've got to be somewhere at two thirty, and it looks like um, we're going to be able to honor that. Sure. So again, thank you. Go ahead. I I appreciate it so much. If you can allow me the privilege to thank my team, because as the leader, you implement policy, and then your team, my team leader Shanish Allure, and the entire team for um, fighting this good fight for dignity and human rights. Thank you so much. Of course, and, and um, gratitude to your team as well. Thank you for taking the time to do that. Thank you so much. Thank you for being with us. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. We'll now move on to the public comment uh, session of this portion of the agenda. 
We have uh, at least one request in the room to make public comment, and that is Annabelle Martinez of the Sujata Jane Anti-Trafficking Initiative. So Ms. Martinez, uh, you can come and just use the table, that's fine. And you have three minutes as per the commission standard procedure. So go ahead. Can you hear me? Okay, perfect. Uh, I had thought I was going in the morning, so I have put a good morning, but it's good afternoon now. Uh, esteemed members of the Little Hoover Commission, as mentioned, my name is Anabel Martinez. I am a policy associate with the Sunita Jane Under Trafficking Initiative at Loyola Law School. Today, I stand before you not only to express our gratitude, but to underscore the paramount importance of the work you undertaken in addressing the needs of labor trafficking survivors. Your report has been instrumental in enabling our initiative to co-sponsor a bill in both the past year and this year, AB 1820 and AB 380 respectively. These bills sought to establish a dedicated labor trafficking unit within the Department of Industrial Relations. We very much appreciate receiving support letters for the bill from the dedicated staff of the Little Hoover Commission. Admittedly, we face many challenges in getting the bills to make it across the finish line. Last year, our bill was vetoed by the governor, and this year, despite our best efforts, the revised bill did not make its way out of the Senate Appropriations Committee. Nevertheless, let me be clear in asserting that the need for a specialized state labor trafficking unit remains not only pertinent, but increasingly urgent. In California, the prevailing focus of law enforcement and social services has predominantly been on addressing tra sex trafficking, inadvertently sidelining labor trafficking victims who language underserved. Our moral obligation is to rectify this imbalance to identify and extend assistance to these vulnerable individuals. Far too often, these victims are misidentified or shockingly treated as perpetrators due to a great lack of comprehension regarding the intricate dynamics of their predicaments. I believe there was a case last year where survivors of trafficking were actually arrested because they were discovered at a wheat growing farm and they were taught to be, they were arrested for illegally growing wheat with them. In fact, they were the survivors themselves. And before they could get any help, they actually fled because they were afraid of what the consequences of, of that arrest would be. One area in which the state can also take the lead when it comes to labor trafficking is helping to identify and provide support to youth who are labor trafficked by forced criminality. While youth who are sex trafficked are immediately seen as victims of trafficking without having to prove that they were forced or coerced into engaging in commercial sex, youth who are labor trafficked still have to have the burden of proving that they were forced and coerced into labor trafficking. The types of underlying crimes for which youth are, who are labor trafficked by forced criminality may include drug offenses, shoplifting, loitering, provision of false documents, and other crimes. A study from 2016, which was uh, across the United States and Canada, uh, found that the vast majority of the of the youth who were labor trafficked were forced to deal drugs. Ms. Martinez, your yeah. three minutes is up. If you can wrap oh, up quickly, yes. please. I just wanted to say um, that there's so much work, that, preventive measure that needs to be done at the state level. And that we're hoping, kind of like everybody said, that we're able to take a public health and community organized and trauma-informed model that comes up with long-term solutions for change for an intersectional lens that is driven by survivor leader input. Um, and SGI is hoping to be a part of this change. And next year, we're hoping to introduce 10 measures that would really challenge the, the state to prevent trafficking in the next 10 years. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Do we have any other requests to make public comment in the room? Could I make one comment on this? Sure. Room? Thank you. Uh, Ms. Martinez, yes. thank you. Uh, you've waited patiently for over four hours <laughs> to come here. So I thank you. I thank your professor, uh, whoever encouraged you uh, to maybe participate in this. Uh, you picked a very, uh, what, a difficult subject, but a very important subject. I hope you stick with it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, if I see no other request to make public comment in the room, uh, Shara, do we have any raised hands online? No, we do not. If not, Mr. Chairman, we've completed the agenda. Uh, thank you. I want to thank all the witnesses and commissioners for their participation. Um, 
And I would be remiss if I didn't uh, express gratitude to the uh, Long Beach uh, Community College for the use of their facilities. They've been uh, generous and gracious enough to permit us to have our, uh, our second uh, hearing um, in this facility. It's always a pleasure uh, to be here. I was particularly impressed um, uh, when I got here this morning with the number of students that attend this campus. Um, if there had been fewer, I, I would have found a better place to park, but that's my own fault. And that's actually indicative of, uh, that's a good sign. And so congratulations to the campus uh, for uh, uh, providing the service to the students and for giving us a home uh, for this hearing. And that concludes our meeting.